अच्छा गुड मॉर्निंग सर गुड मॉर्निंग सर रेस्पेक्टेड प्रोफेसर पीवीजीडी प्रसाद रेड्डी गार हनरबल वैस चांसलर आंध्र यूनिवर्सिटी प्रिंसपाल एयू कॉलेज ऑफ फार्मस्यूटिकल सैनसेस अं प्रेस आफ् टू डेस् वेबिनार प्रोफेसर वाई राजेन्द्र प्रसाद गार फैकल्टी मेबर्स आफ एयू कॉलेज आफ फार्मस्यूटिकल सैनसेस डिस्टिंग स्पीकर्स प्रिंसपाल अं फैकल्टी आफ एफिटेड कॉलेज रिसर्च स्काल स्टूडेंट अंड वेल विशर्स आफ प्रोफेसर अन्नपूर्ण मैडम ए वेरी गुड मार्निंग टू आल आफ यू दिस इंटरनेशनल वेबिनार आन हेडल ड्रग्स फॉर क्रॉनिक डिजॉर्डर्स इज बी आर्गनज इन हानर आफ प्रोफेसर ए अन्नपूर्ण who served this institution for the last 27 years and uh, retired on 31st 1 so so 31st 12 2021 the eminent speakers were invited to deliver talk in this webinar covering research on herbal drugs and recent advances in herbal drugs herbal drug research and advances in pharmacology research also invited to deliver talk on career opportunities for pharmacy students in Yes. To briefly introduce the speakers, Professor Nazib Salah, who is an associate professor in physiology, University of Malaya, has been working on the evaluation of herbal drugs for diabetes and diabetic diabetes-induced complications for the last 20 years. Who is who have been working in close association with? We are also working with uh, in close association with uh, Professor Nazib and his team for the last five years, and we published about ten uh, research papers. Uh, with Nazib and team in uh, various international journals, and uh, filed an international patent, which is going to be published in a couple of days. The second speaker is Dr. Kameshwar Badri, who is an associate professor uh, in uh, pharmacology. Uh, he is uh, from uh, Cancer Research Institute of Morehouse School of Medicine, USA. He graduated from Antesara University. and he uh, he has been awarded uh, several uh, awards and honors and fellowships and published a good number of uh, publications in international journals of repute and we have uh, an association with uh, uh, dr kameshwar badri uh, for the last uh, uh, 10 years and uh, he is he has been guiding our students uh, for uh, their uh, career in uh, us the third speaker is dr krishna kumar veeravalli who is an associate professor in cancer biology and pharmacology of at uh, University of Illinois College of Medicine USA who is our alumnus and was a student of professor Y Annapurna he has been working on the brain ischemic stroke and published a good number of research articles in international journals of repute and received several awards and fellowships he has been helping the students for their career opportunities in US few number of uh, uh, our students are also working in his team at present the fourth speaker Uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar Boyni, who is an assistant professor of uh, pharmacology at the Department of Pharmacology and Pharmaceutical Sciences, University of Boston, USA, he has been received a number, uh, number of awards and fellowships. He has uh, published a good number of articles in reputed journals. Uh, we have uh, a few publications uh, published uh, together uh, with uh, Krishna Kumar Boyni, and he is also helping our uh, uh, students uh, for their uh, career opportunities in US. Uh, he is going to deliver. Uh, Uh, talk on uh, the career opportunities today so i uh, with this i sincerely thank all the speakers from uh, bro- bottom of my heart for uh, organizing our invitation in a short notice uh, thank you uh, now i request our uh, principal sir professor vai rajan prasad garu to give his opening remarks sir. thank you honorable vice chancellor sir professor pvgd prasad reddy my colleagues Professor Girija Shankar, Professor Girija Shastri, Dr. Vishal Kumar, Krishna Majari Pawar, Dr. Murali Krishna Kumar, and Dr. Sai Raja, research scholars, 
speakers from USA and Malaysia. A very good morning to you all and good evening to the speakers in USA. Thank you all of you for joining here. We are organizing this uh, international webinar in connection with the super admission of our colleague, senior colleague, Professor Annapurna, who has done an excellent service all these years. And uh, we are really happy to have you here. And I need not say much about Andhra University. Andhra University is the one university which started excellent research on medicinal plants and herbal remedies way back in 1930s. Thanks to the, vision, the then visionary Vice Chancellor, Dr. C. R. Reddy, who used to invite eminent professors from different states. And uh, two such eminent professors, Professor T. R. Seshadri, who worked under a Nobel laureate Robinson, joined the chemistry department. And Professor S. Rangaswamy was the founder head of the pharmacy, who also worked under a Nobel laureate Rackstein from the University of Basel. This has provided a very strong uh, research foundation on plants and uh, herbal remedies. And as you all know, Andhra University is the only second university in the country to discover a new drug, peruvoside from Tibetia neripolia, we call it as Pachaganeru, used in the congestive heart failure. And still it is the uh, only modern drug in congestive heart failure along with the uh, And the second drug is from University of Punjab, Chandigarh where they have, again from pharmacy department, chandolium amidate, and neuromuscular agent. Apart from these two drugs, all other drugs are not at all being used that are discovered in India. They are either mixtures, but these are the only two drugs internationally acclaimed by the scientific community. And we are very proud of these drug discoveries happening in Andhra University. And we are very fortunate to have a very dynamic vice chancellor. In fact, after the first generation vice chancellor, so you could see again a very visionary vice chancellor in Professor Prasad Radiaru. Whenever we approach him, he always is ready and never say no to anything which is really promising and happening to the university. Several initiatives have been taken up in his tenure and you will be seeing soon they all come into reality and uh, we are very happy to organize this seminar this morning and our honorable vice chancellor also joined. He is a noted computer science professor in Andhra University and a noted IT technology person in Visakhapatnam city. We are very fortunate to have him as a And uh, we have the speakers, as Isur Kumar was telling, one is Dr. Krishna Kumar Veravalli from University of Illinois, very noted university. He is a direct student of uh, Dr. Anapurna. I met him along. Uh, during my stay in USA, he invited me. Hello, Professor Dr. Sevaradi is also there. I met both of them. They are being, uh, really doing very good work, sir, in the heart, in the brain stroke mechanisms. They induce stroke to the brain and see what are the changes happening when a brain stroke occurs and how it can be prevented. All these things really go a big way because we see nowadays very frequently brain stroke. Uh, is a major cause in the uh, brain unconsciousness and all. And we are very happy to see Krishna Kumar Veravalli. And also Krishna Boyina, another student of Annapurna, he is also working in University of Houston. And we have uh, Mr. Badri, Dr. Badri. He is also working on obesity and cardiovascular research. Uh, and then we have from Malaysia, we have a professor, uh, Dr. Shale. He is also working with us. And uh, what I want to inform to all these speakers is we are entering into MOU with different universities. Recently, we have entered into an MOU with the University of Western Sydney. Uh, our vice chancellor is very eager to see such a MOUs happening, not merely for the purpose of MOU. It should be a fruitful one, both in terms of quantitative and qualitative output. And we are very happy and we invite you all uh, for an MOE with Andhra University, particularly in the pharmacy department. And uh, without taking much of your time, our Vice Chancellor is very busy today. I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor to give his valuable message this morning. Thank you, sir. Professor Prasad Reddy. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, is my voice audible there? 
Yes, sir. It is audible, sir. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so let me once again okay greet all the participants and uh, principal of uh, the College of Pharmacy, uh, Dr. Ryan Prasad Garu and uh, uh, Dr. Ishwar Kumar. And I see the presence of uh, Girija Shankar, Girija Shastri, Krishnamanjari Power, Murali over there. And uh, I also see, see all the speakers, uh, Dr. Krishna Boina, Dr. Krishna Veeravalli, Dr. Badri. And uh, in fact, Ishwar also made a mention of okay, Dr. Nazib. Uh, these are all the speakers, in fact, who are going to speak today on this uh, international webinar on uh, herbal remedies for uh, chronic disorders. Uh, uh, which has been organized uh, by the Andhra University uh, College of Pharmacy in connection with the superannuation uh, function of uh, uh, Professor Annapurna Madam. I'm so glad that, you know, uh, some of the students of uh, uh, Professor Annapurna Madam, in fact, you know, they gave, they gave consent to deliver uh, uh, talks, okay, on uh, the subject. Uh, and that shows, uh, in fact, the kind of gratitude, okay, that they have, okay, on the professor as well as uh, on the university. And uh, this is really a welcome initiative. Uh, like, you know, it was uh, uh, mentioned by Professor Rajendra Prasad, uh, okay, during his uh, uh, brief talk. Uh, um, you know, over the last you know two years, uh, especially with reference to Andhra University, we are looking for a paradigm shift with reference to the way in which uh, we offer education, okay, on the campus. Uh, uh, per se, exactly two years back, okay, uh, it was you know the initiative of uh, Professor Ramnamurthy, uh, who is also a senior professor, okay, from uh, pharmacy department, who was in fact you know re-employed uh, after uh, retirement. And uh, Professor Rajendra Prasad, in fact, you know, he gave a proposal to the government of India to establish a, a wonderful uh, uh, pharma testing and uh, incubation kind of a laboratory on the campus of the university. And, uh, you know, we have uh, got about 25 crores a grant from government of India. And uh, I must, you know, share this with all the participants, you know, uh, the infrastructure is getting ready and we are, in fact, you know, placing an order for all the instruments uh, and in this connection very recently uh, professor rajendra prasad in fact okay he he got me introduced to uh, two wonderful okay alumni from the department if i am correct dr varma from yes. agent pharma and uh, dr gupta i think okay from suraksha pharma am i right uh, rajendra yes, prasad sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. You know, these are, you know, two wonderful people who visited Andhra University and, you know, we entered into an MOU with them to establish a, a wonderful, you know, state of the art, okay, with all digitalization, uh, the okay, incubation center uh, in the premises of uh, Andhra University so that, you know, the young students, the pharmacy students, either the B pharma students or M pharma students or, you know, we have got, you know, the D farm, these uh, boys, okay, they can, okay, go to that particular laboratory and in case if they have an idea, uh, then, you know, we are also coming out with the concept of, you know, the startup cell so that, you know, the teachers as well as, you know, local industry is also there. We take that support uh, and we wish to, in fact, you know, mentor their ideas and, you know, support them. So this is, okay, one of the novel initiatives that has uh, that's been taken up by this department. And the second, okay, very interesting thing that happened, okay, in the last one year was uh, uh, we have entered into an MOU with uh, Purdue University, the pharmacy department of Andhra University. Uh, they have entered into okay an MOU with Purdue University, and uh, the, already okay a couple of lectures have been arranged with reference to the intellectual property rights, uh, uh, and uh, you know with reference to pharma and all. They have trained almost uh, all the teachers on the campus. Okay, not only the pharmacy department teachers, over 200 teachers on the campus. In fact, they have attended okay to the uh, workshop. You know, three-day full workshop organized by Purdue University professors. And this is also a very okay, uh, uh, wonderful initiative taken up by the pharmacy department. So pharmacy, in fact, okay, is right now happening, right? So uh, I see a lot of uh, you know demand and progress, okay, for this particular college, uh, especially Professor Rajnath Prasad, okay, he has been doing okay wonderful work, and uh, he, he has in fact told me that uh, Professor Annapurna, in fact, okay, is. Uh, one of the best teachers okay from this particular department and uh, we have got you know wonderful clones also available okay in the department i see girija shankar girija shastri morali morali is also doing a wonderful work and uh, krishna manjari power she has got you know wonderful projects she's been in fact inducted into university administration also she is the youngest uh, you know, executive council member of the university 
So the government of Andhra Pradesh, in fact, okay, recognized the talent and potential of uh, the Andhra University Pharmacy Department. And I see, okay, very good days ahead, okay, especially for the students of uh, the pharmacy department. I know uh, over the last, you know, one and a half years, especially the DFARM students, because, you know, the DFARM students in their final year, they go to a nearest hospital and okay they do some kind of a practice over there they have in fact rendered excellent service uh, uh, to the public uh, because you know over the last one and a half years due to this uh, covid pandemic and all um, uh, not many people were readily available to provide and assist you know the public uh, rendering service but you know fortunately the students of andhra university especially from the uh, pharmacy department dpharm students they have extended, you know, their service in King George Hospital, which for over uh, six months, okay, as a part of their internship. And uh, uh, they, in fact, you know, they got, uh, they brought very good name to the university also that way. So this is also uh, really, okay, a, a welcome initiative. And coming to the, okay, topic uh, that is, you know, the herbal remedies and all. In India, in fact, is known for this kind of uh, medicine. And uh, uh, you, you see, okay, uh, the, that, okay, what is that? Uh, um, Anandaya medicine, okay. Anandaya medicine, if I am correct. A lot of you know, shut up okay, about that Anandaya medicine, okay, in the very beginning. And ultimately, everybody said that you know, Anandaya medicine is also working, okay, to probably, I think, uh, um, reduce uh, the impact of this particular, okay, COVID pandemic. And uh, a lot of you know, experimentation and all. Finally, government also allowed, you know, to. In fact, uh, continue that particular uh, supply of okay, Anandaya medicine. Okay, it is okay one of the okay uh, latest uh, okay herbal remedies uh, that uh, almost everybody okay had looked at okay in these uh, current times. And this uh, you know when it comes to you know health and all you know I also personally okay read okay certain books and you know uh, out of my own interest and you know people uh, keep saying that you know health is always very very important. And 80% of the problems, okay, that what we get, especially the current generation, okay, uh, human beings, uh, because, you know, we don't, okay, in fact, okay, put our bodies, okay, to work for a long time. Back, okay, maybe I think we would have used our body 100% more for doing uh, some kind of physical work. But these days, you know, the physical work, okay, is not there. That is, okay, one of the okay for uh, uh, health issues and 80 percent of the health issues are only just because of the reason that uh, the body physical body is not okay put to okay uh, the right uh, use and people also say that you know 10 percent uh, is because of the food habits uh, that uh, uh, we have okay and uh, mostly you know our food habits are food habits are not really okay that great and maybe I think remaining 10% would be okay because of, you know, the karmic or atmospheric uh, issues. But 90% of the issues can always be solved provided, you know, you, you, you put, okay, your body to right usage and, okay, consume right food. Not only that, you know, I, I, is my voice audible there? Okay, yeah, yes, sir, sir. yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is audible. You know, I, I've listened to, okay, one uh, lecture, okay, long back, if I recall, there was a scientist, in fact, you know, who was talking about uh, yeah, sure, sure. the relationship between okay, a human body and the soil also. See, uh, unless and otherwise you maintain some kind of a good relation with the soil also, most of the times, okay, he says that uh, the physical health uh, cannot be maintained. And he, he okay, in fact, he made him mention that, you know, mostly these days people try to develop their relationship with soil only after death. But unfortunately, okay, that should not happen. And even affluent society also should okay develop a habit of uh, probably I think okay putting their you know hands and uh, legs okay on the soil, doing some kind of you know activity with reference to soil, and unless and otherwise you develop okay that kind of a relation with soil, because after all you know the humans they are extension okay of okay the planet or the earth. So that relationship with soil okay maybe I think it could be in the form of mud bath also. That is okay. One of the okay excellent initiatives that is being proposed these days uh, to maintain you know physical health, which is a natural remedy. Okay, in that way, and also the kind of food that we eat, because as such you know it is uh, recommended these days that you know consume at least 40 percent uh, okay in uh, raw in uh, uh, raw vegetables or you know the fruits because they are alive, right? 
so when you don't okay consume the food okay which is alive that means most of most of this particular food okay they say that it ca- it carries a lot of enzymes which you do not have okay in your intestines and unless and otherwise you know you consume this particular food okay the digestion also may not happen because mostly we go for cooked food and by the time you go for cooking okay all these you know live things okay they get they become dead and so it, mostly you are stressing okay the body other uh, uh, in that way and the kind of water that you drink okay and i don't know whether i can make a mention okay on this but scientifically okay i was told that it is proven that okay if you try to probably i think drink water directly that is okay uh, taken out from a tap and uh, there is a theory okay which is also getting proved that you know water always remembers things it has got memory you you take a piece of water and put it in okay uh, uh, some quantity of water put it in a glass and speak to that you know it remembers so when water is flowing okay through several pipes and all with lot of energy it carries lot of disturbance lot of memory that's the reason why you know they say that you know at one point of time people used to okay put water okay in in a bowl and okay uh, keep it like that throughout the night and next day morning they used to drink okay because so that you know it becomes still and does not carry disturbance noise and all and such water when you drink you know you will have better health these are all you know some of the theories okay that our uh, forefathers used to believe and okay today also now scientifically they are getting proved so like that you know natural remedies you know for example that ginger all these things you know these are all natural remedies and for many disorders even anxiety disorders also people do say that there are so many natural remedies available and i am sure that you know our department has done wonderful work and the alumni of the department in fact is the pride of the university is that the pride of our university is alumni of pharmacy department no other place i have seen an alumni from a particular department coming and donating about 4 crores rupees to construct okay a wonderful academic facility on the campus so the building the academic okay building that's been used by pharmacy college has been donated by a, a, a very proud you know alumnus okay from that particular college so that that's that in fact you know sounds very big and that shows that the alumni okay the that graduates okay who who were produced by this particular okay college through andhra university they have gone you know they have spread their wings very wide and they were okay into uh, high positions not only in india but also outside at the same time you no know, apart from reaching okay such a success okay and they are also trying to contribute something back to the department that you know, really volumes about the kind of relationship that is maintained by the professors with the students of the department so i am so happy that today even my administration okay i am getting lot of support in fact okay from this particular department per se rajendra prasad in fact he is supporting me and uh, you know ramana murthy even after retirement okay i, I took him back okay to run that particular you know pharmacy incubation center he has been doing lot of work morally in fact okay he is, he is trying to establish a wonderful laboratory and very recently the ap state government people vigilance department they have reached me they say that you know they are okay they want to establish a laboratory in the pharmacy department to test some alcohol related products and all krishmanjari power is supporting me so like that you know almost all the teachers they are you know in fact supporting okay andhra university in all in various ways and uh, I, I, i'm really hopeful because you know by march of this particular year end of march that is another 3 months the pharmacy testing laboratory incubation center which is coming at sirupuram junction a huge facility first of its kind in any of the state universities i would say that about 65000 sft space is getting ready in all its forms and we wish to in fact you know equip that digitalize that entire you know pro, uh, uh, laboratory and see to it that through that particular laboratory okay the incubation activity should happen and also the testing of you know the pharma uh, composition or products okay should also take place okay from there so that the students okay from the department the scholars from the department should be able to access this and render also the public service generate revenue for the university also this is okay one of the initiatives that we have embarked upon and i am confident that okay i would be able to in fact inaugurate this particular facility by 30th march of this particular year so that you know that also becomes another fe- feather in the cap of uh, uh, not only andhra university but also its 
very proud constituent college andhra university college of pharmaceutical pharmaceutical sciences and uh, i i wish to in fact you know draw support from uh, uh, the international uh, uh, alumni because i see okay many people okay right now okay present okay for this particular uh, uh, webinar uh, mr krishna boyna and krishna kumar i see them okay from outside and dr nagi i think okay you are maintaining good relation with all of them the alumni support okay what is okay a very important today for the andhra university is alumni support because you know we are uh, in another 3 years we are uh, in fact you know moving into a next century of operations the centenary celebrations and unless and otherwise okay the, you support andhra university because you know today uh, people have got lot of hopes on andhra university over the past you know for maybe i think 5 6 years over 10 years somehow the university did not uh, do well okay for various reasons but you know it is the duty of okay the, not only the administration who is okay functioning here even it is the duty uh, uh, of the alumni so that you know we, we require you know uh, the support uh, the support that means uh, the intellectual wealth intellectual support from all of you so that you know the next generation uh, would okay uh, feel very safe and we wish to promote them we wish to okay in fact see to it that the next generation also is nurtured through your knowledge and okay once you support andhra university with the kind of infrastructure that i am building with all my team of you know administrators my registrar my rector my principals my deans together you know in fact we are contemplating to in fact establish a wonderful university and uh, uh, I, i i in fact you know make a plea okay to all the okay alumni especially the international alumni and also alumni who are running okay wonderful pharmacy companies in india i wish to have you know as, as you all your support so that together you know we can build a wonderful society and wonderful university so with this you know few remarks uh, let me once again okay thank uh, all the uh, speakers who have in fact you know given their consent to in fact deliver okay wonderful lectures and also all the students participants as well as experts okay for uh, in fact you know taking their time okay one full day time to probably i think participate in this particular okay webinar uh, so that uh, okay their knowledge you know gets uh, enhanced uh, thank you ayan prasad and thank you ishwar kumar for this opportunity thank, thank you. you thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir, thank you, sir. to our honorable vice chancellor sir for uh, your thought provoking address touching the various dimensions of uh, pharmacy and different activities going on in the university you are really a source of inspiration to all of us sir uh, you are, we are very thankful to you for your kind presence uh, today in spite of your busy schedule i know that uh, you are very busy today we are really thankful to you sir uh, for coming and uh, addressing us thank you once again sir thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you next sir th thank you sir uh, i think uh, now uh, dr kameshwar are you ready sir yes can you hear me yes sir yes sir yes sir. if you are ready just uh, i'll ask our uh, colleague uh, Uh, Professor uh, Vigirja Sastri, Madam, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kamesar Bandri. Uh, good evening, sir, Dr. Bandri. I am Professor Rajendra Prasad, principal here. We welcome you for this talk uh, this morning here in India. thank you very much sir for your last comments thank you good morning i request to professor girija sastri to speak about it. good evening uh, dr padri i am dr professor girija sastri vice chair person of college of pharmaceutical sciences and industry and i would like to i need read your bio data in brief it's my great pleasure to read about dr kameshwar rao Kameshwara Badri is currently working as an assistant professor in pharmacology and toxicology at Cardiovascular Research Institute of Mayer House School of Medicine, Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and director of Clinical Analytical Chemistry Laboratory, COVID-19 Testing Laboratory, Clinical Research Center, Mayer House School of Medicine, Atlanta. He is graduated from Sri Venkateswara University, Tirupati. and pursued his degree in doctor of philosophy in biochemistry and master of science in biochemistry from the same university that is rangeshwara university he has completed his undergraduate that is bachelor of science from silver jubilee 
government degree college kannur he has received certification from american society of clinical pathology molecular biology he is a re- his research in- interest mainly focuses on molecular mechanism of adipogenesis and smooth muscle myogenesis and associated disorders health disparities and drug discovery his clinical interests include metabolic disorders obesity diabetes mellitus and hypertension today dr kameshwara has published up to date he has published uh, 40 plus research papers and uh, review articles in peer reviewed and high impact scientific journals he has been elected as advocacy representative for the american physiology physiological society endocrinology and metabolism section steering committee between 2020 to 2023 He was recognized for exemplary service by ASIOA 2018, and he also he was recognized for outstanding service to Savannah State University Regional Science and Engineering Fair between 2012 and 15. Received an outstanding contribution award that is on a student educational enriched program Georgia uh, University in 2014. advocacy representative twice represented american thoracic society and attended field day at washington dc to request to more finding for nih and ba and prevention of tb in between march 20 13 to 2014 he has received talented scientist award inter- international conference on medicinal plants and herbal products rock ville in 2012 and uh, today he is going to speak on recent developments in obesity research medicinal plants as potential novel therapies and uh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to read about a brief introduction about um, mr Do- dr kameshwar badri and thank you very much and i would like to continue his speech followed by me thank you sir. now dr badri please Thank you so much, madam. Uh, it's a. Uh, uh, I thank you all. Uh, VC Prasad Reddy Garu, Principal Garu, Rajan Prasad Garu, uh, Registrar and Director uh, uh, Garu, and then uh, especially uh, the organizing secretary, Iswar Kumar Garu, whom I met uh, a few years ago at Experimental Biology. Uh, especially the main. Uh, a uh, key person today's uh, meeting uh, professor anapurna garu anapurna madam garu so i thank you all for giving me this opportunity and uh, remaining dignitaries thank you so much good morning my name is kamesh uh, rao bajri so let me share my presentation so can i start my presentation sir you see it yes yes please sir it's in presentation mode right uh, i'm not sure about that yeah yes okay i think so so uh today's my uh title of my talk is recent developments in obesity research so basically i'm going to briefly go over uh some introduction and uh, some of the latest developments what's happening in obesity research and also i'm going to touch upon medicinal plants Uh, as a potential novel therapy is given the uh, limitations associated with obesity treatments so i'm faculty at uh, uh, morehouse school of medicine and uh, since uh, we had covid i started i set up a covid testing lab and uh, we regularly test our students every two weeks so make sure our campus is safe and uh, so i'm running that as a uh, in charge uh, director so all of you know obesity is a chronic metabolic disorder uh, it is mainly characterized by excess adiposity and uh, it is a comorbid condition for many many uh, metabolic disorders including um, you know diabetes mellitus cardiovascular uh, diseases cancer and um, you know let, uh, lately like uh, even covid-19 is a uh, um, uh, um you are going to see more mortality with the uh, obese conditions so so what is this obesity and how we like look at this obesity how to determine uh, if somebody is like uh, overweight or obese so all of you might be knowing the body mass index so body mass index is like uh, we generally measure 
uh, using weight per meter square. Uh, so weight in kilograms. So if the BMI is less than 18.5, it is uh, uh, under. If it is 18 point, if it is between 18.5 and 24.9, it is a, a, a normal weight. And if it is between 25 and 29.9, it is overweight. Above 30 and less than 35 is obese. And over 35 is a chronic obesity. These are like international standards. However, if you look at uh, some of the Asian countries, they have like a, trying to separately develop their own standards. So there are like a certain uh, groups uh, lately, they started like a making, using different strategy, not this international strategy for Asian Indians, especially Indians. So generally overweight will be considered between 23 to 24.9 BMI um, in India and uh, more than 25 as obese. So if you look at like uh, uh, some of these demographics uh, at the US level, there is like a tremendous shift in obesity, overweight and obesity uh, uh, percentages. So you see pretty much like the same thing at global level also. If you look at like uh, United States, so almost right now, currently about uh, two thirds of the population is uh, either overweight or obese. That is like pretty much um, about 66.66%. And uh, the alarming situation is the children, the young are also getting uh, obese. So that is like an overwhelming and alarming situation. So that is one of the reasons why like uh, we need to be like a very uh, focused and start finding uh, better cures uh, for this situation. And even if you look at like uh, obesity, it is a global pandemic and uh, Almost since 1975, um, uh, the obesity rates were tripled. And if you look at some of these numbers, you can see like uh, you will see like uh, millions of uh, children mil uh, getting affected uh, either by uh, overweight or obesity and also adult population is also getting affected by this. And uh, because it is a, um, one of the comorbid situation for a lot of the uh, metabolic diseases. Uh, it requires immediate attention. Uh, even it should have been like a started long time ago. But whatever the reason it is, somehow uh, some of the research associated with uh, obesity research and some of these a little bit trickier. So maybe that is one of the limitations. The progress is relatively uh, slower and also like uh, when it comes to the metabolic factors. If you look at the etiology, so generally we always know like uh, it is considered um, the energy uh, uh positive energy balance is the one that is going to uh regulate uh, the weight so the food intake and physical activity and balance between these two things are going to like uh, determine our uh, uh, body weight so if you look at some of the reasons given causes given here like uh, overeating overeating low energy expenditure physical inactivity and there are like several different situations, conditions that can like contribute for each individual one. So if you take like overweighting, uh, socio-cultural situation. So if you take like a lot of our uh, South Indians, we are rice eaters and generally we try to like eat stomach food. So similarly, if you take some of the European countries, there it is considered like a very big personality, big body will be considered as a uh, manliness and then uh, generally to show that leadership or something like that they always try to like have these uh, really big bodies by eating more so like that there are like so many different uh, situations you can see so similarly low energy expenditure it can be because of aging or sex or uh, genetics or epigenetics other factors associated with uh, sarcopenia and uh, sometimes like uh, medications so uh, microbiome, yeah. right now uh, Recently, like a microbiome is like a, uh, getting more popularity. So all these are different factors also like responsible for, for uh, low energy expenditure and also like a physical inactivity, which also like uh, connected with the remaining two. So put together. So what I mean to say is like it's a balance, but I say it is more than that. It's not just a balance. There are like other factors uh, when it comes to obesity. Obesity is not like a monogenic condition. It's not because of one single factor. It is a uh, multiple factors affecting at the same time, uh, changing in so many different directions. If you look at right side, uh, right side figure, 
picture environmental and uh, society uh, related issues. So you have like uh, different parameters affecting the weight. And at the bottom side, if you look at like red, uh, red section, biology, biological uh, parameters that affect including sleep, genetics, epigenetics, uh, circadian rhythm, inflammation, medications. There are like so many different uh, 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 factors associated with this uh, leading to cause or weight or obesity. So when it when you look at this fat, so generally when we talk about fat, all these while we know like a one fat, white fat, which we generally consider bad. So up to certain portion, certain percentage, it is good for the body. And after that, it is not good. And, uh, you know, when we look at like a adipose tissue, fat is like a adipose tissue. When we look at adipose tissue, so it has like effect on different systems. So it has, a, uh, it will influence immune system. So it will, it has a, uh, its effect on brain by regulating appetite, satiety, energy expenditure and activity. It regulates blood pressure by regulating endothelial functions heart muscle contractility and smooth muscle cell contractility and other parameters. So it will regulate insulin sensitivity, lipid accumulation and all these different factors uh, by effect, um, by playing a role on uh, liver. So similarly, pancreas, muscle. So as you know, uh, muscle plays a major role in insulin sensitivity along with uh, uh, other uh, endocrine organs like pancreas. So even all this, fat has like a tremendous uh, uh, key role in regulating so many metabolic pathways. And it uh, uh, causes so many different uh, uh, health issues. Uh, it can be psychological, emotional, or physical, as shown in right side, uh, top right side corner. And lately we start seeing like so many studies, uh, it is also plays a major role in uh, COVID-19 patho uh, uh, pathology and uh, uh, mortality. So uh, some of the recent literature data shows that uh, uh, obesity with uh, 30 to 35 uh, uh, BMI has like a 40% of, of mortality if they get infected with COVID-19. And if the BMI is more than 40, it is 100% mortality. So it is like a, a, a major issue and uh, Right now, if you look at like a population, it is it is a technically becoming like a global pandemic. And also it is associated with the different cancers, about like 13 cancers are associated with overweight and obesity, as you see here in the lower bottom corner. So when it comes to uh, obesity prevention, there are like a ABC rule. So always you can adopt new healthy habits. New healthy habits include like a physical activity, eating healthy, eating more greens and vegetables and fruits. So reducing like uh, uh, using motor vehicles uh, and also avoiding fast foods and like a sedentary life, avoiding sedentary life. So these are like a, a one key uh, step. And second one is balancing uh, caloric intake. So make sure we calculate how much we are taking in and how much we are spending. So as long as like uh, we focus more on that one, so, and also like a third one is controlling our uh, weight gain. So these three ABCs, like it, it says, it looks like so simple, but over the period of many, many years, we, we have been like uh, uh, known these things for many years and uh, still the obesity rates are going up and it reported from 70, um, uh, 1975s means like uh, almost two thirds of American population either obese or overweight means it requires immediate attention, uh, whatever we are talking. So either we are not implementing or even if we are implementing, somehow uh, it's not working out. So that's one of the thing uh, we are going to like uh, look in detail as we move forward. So when, when we look at obesity treatments, there are like, a, if somebody starts like a getting overweight, so a little over BMI 25 um, and less than 27, so from 25 onwards, they can start like uh, going for a healthy eating, physical activity and behavioral, behavioral therapies. Because we generally a lot of times ignore behavioral therapy, but uh, just not eating right and physical activity. But it, it's proven that the behavioral therapies always like uh, help to uh, keep up with these uh, uh, healthy habits and then the physical activities and then 
keep the weight in control. And the BMI, if it goes like uh, if it is higher than 27, so it's always better to like uh, go for a formal a pharmacological management. So we are going to look at some pharmacological management. And unfortunately, there is no good pharmacological uh, management therapy available at this stage. So many of these drugs that are available for the treatment of obesity are overweight. So they are going to either work on a brain uh, through uh, working on our satiety and uh, 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 hunger centers of the brain. They are going to be like uh, either associated with uh, uh, addiction uh, and some of the drugs um, uh, that are being like uh, brought into market and then uh, uh, they were like uh, restricted, banned because of their association affecting the heart because of the uh, some of the meta uh, pathways that are associated with cardiac muscle tissue. So if somebody has like a high BMI higher than 35 uh, with the additional complications like either diabetes or insulin resistance or cardiovascular problems, so it is always better to go surgery. However, surgery, you always know it is invasive and uh, a lot of times we get like a little bit scared and not to go for that one. But uh, given the advancement in recent laparoscopic technology, maybe this might get better and better. So let us go and see how it is going to like uh, uh, work out on real time scenario. So even the lifetime modification. So this is one of the study done by Emory University, uh, uh, data presented by Emory University. Uh, so lifestyle modifications associated uh, uh, followed by um bariatric surgeries so it showed like a tremendous effect uh, on resolving many of these uh, uh, obesity or overweight associated situations however even though we see some of these uh, uh, data from isolated uh, studies but overall is it really healthy um, uh, working at a societal level as a global level so is there any pill available that we can like simply use to control overweight or obesity. So that's the, that's the goal. Like if something can be developed uh, to uh, achieve the best way <laughs> in non-invasive non way, it is going to be like a, a excellent uh, uh, choice. So if you look at like uh, adult obesity rates, so overweight of men and women, it's been like a pretty standard for a very, very long time. However, if you look at obesity rates, so obesity of women is relatively higher than men and it is being like a going up and it is increasing since the 1960 till now so even if you look at the child obesity trends they are going up so starting from 2 to 5 year old kids and then 6 to 11 year old 12 to 19 uh, year youth so pretty much like it is uh, the obesity rates are increasing which is alarming and we have to so especially scientific community need to focus on uh, studying molecular mechanisms pathogenicity as well as like a, a coming out with a, a very good choice of uh, uh, drugs to treat uh, overweight and obesity is a, a key so when you look at pharmacotherapy so over the period of like um, um, 100 years or so 120 years there are so many drugs came into the market but nothing really sustained and then nothing proven to be like uh, uh, very good. So you see like so many uh, different drugs presented here. Many of them, as I, I was like uh, mentioning, many of them were like uh, withdrawn because of the side effects. So are maybe their dependency. Uh, so drug dependency situations. Very few are my, uh, right now are being in, um, uh, in the market. So early stat is one of them uh, which really directly work on the uh, lipid metabolism by reducing the digestion. However, these different drugs have their own uh, side effects and uh, this slide shows some of these uh, uh, drugs and their mechanism of action. If you look at early stat, early stat it is a lipase inhibitor. So it, it, it inhibits the lipase in the uh, digestive tract. However, because of this, so uh, the person who is going to take this is like over the counter uh, available drug in us so one of the major drawbacks with this one is a statoria and the flatulence i saw some of the people taking this drug so they take this early start medicine uh, there is like one alley 
so they take it and then within and they have their food and within no time they like running to the uh, bathroom so the other drugs you see uh, lower pasadine so its mechanism of, of action is a serotonin agonist similarly uh, hemia so it is also associated with the uh, um, nervous system so if you look at uh, mechanism of action of other group contrary so same thing it is associated with opioid receptor and uh, saxenda so it is a glp1 receptor agonist actually there is a more and more uh, studies are and clinical trials are being happened with uh, uh, undergoing right now with uh, new groups of drugs related to this group but all these even though uh, they are showing a reasonably good uh, effect on um, um, dyslipidemia but still initially they are showing like some level of effect and then it is going to saturate and uh, like a losing weight after that situation is uh, relatively like uh, gets lesser and lesser as the time passes and these have like a significantly uh, uh, major side effects which cannot be ignored and then this is one of the reasons why like uh, there is every requirement so technically there is no good drug a single pill uh, without any reasonable like uh, uh, side effects uh, in the market right now to treat overweight or obesity and of course bariatric surgery the pictures itself will make us a scary so this la uh, laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding which is uh, shown in uh, top left corner so there will be a, a band and by adjusting this uh, uh, band so they can control the size of the stomach and then uh, uh, so that way we can control the food ingestion by that particular person but when it comes to these bariatric surgeries, there is a, these are like a very, very invasive. You take B, C, D, like a sleeve gastrectomy, like a cutting off major portion of the stomach, or a, a Ruyan Y gastric bypass, where major portion of the uh, stomach will be cut. At the same time, there will be by, bypass of uh, uh, um, this uh, digestive tract from uh, stomach to the lower portion of the digest, small intestine. So similarly, bilio pancreatic diversion with uh, duodenal switch. So when it comes to this one, it is always scarier. And right now it is advised for only the uh, people who are suffering with the B uh, obesity, with the BMI higher than 35 with the complications, this is advisable. But hopefully if uh, technology changes and gets better, maybe this might get better, but uh, uh, there were like uh, many, many studies shown yeah, bariatric surgery is going to like reduce after the surgery uh, following strict nutritional and lifestyle modifications it is going to like reduce uh, insulin resistance and it uh, like a gly good glycemic control and lipid levels and cardiovascular problems and all these but if they don't follow these uh, uh, healthy habits within no time all those are going to like come back and they will be like uh, back to their normal situation However, with all this, there are like a lot of supplements that are coming into market and it became like a multi-billion uh, dollar um, uh, business. And uh, I'm like, a, some time ago, I was like surprised to see just uh, this uh, uh, Neem Datun toothbrush is being sold for $15 only in Amazon. So switching gears, let us see what is adipose tissue. So all of you know, we call fat and adipose tissue. So for a very long time, we have known like only one fat, but the recent development shows that uh, we have more than one type of fat in our body. So white fat is uh, one of the types that we always uh, know very well about it. So when it comes to white fat, it, uh, it plays a major role in whole, whole body energy metabolism, homeostasis, energy storage, fatty acid release, it has an endocrine function, so it was shown to like a secret uh, uh, different uh, bio uh, factors. They will be released in fat and they are going to play their role in different tissues. And uh, we all know it plays a major role in heat insulation and uh, it plays a, uh, uh, it provides mechanical cushion to some of the internal organs. However, uh, the two other different types of fats were identified recently. 
one of them is known as a brown fat so technically it is known as a baby fat so it's you will find like a more of this baby fat in uh, human infants uh, and then you also find uh, brown fat in adults so recently they developed technologies to identify this fat so that, that's one of the reason why past a few years uh, there is more and more uh, studies are being done so you can see like a uh, different fat depots white fat depots as shown in these uh, uh, white pockets and then uh, brown fat depots on right side uh, right side of this uh, uh, person so however there is a third type of fat known as a beige fat or bright fat it is a uh, intermediate between white fat and brown fat so it is uh, named as a uh, beige or bright fat so the beige or bright fat depots are present in white fat itself. So if you find like a white fat, within white fat, there will be pockets of these uh, uh, brown, beige fat. So there is more and more studies are being like uh, uh, done right now because of the differences between these different types of fats. So when you look at this brown fat, so it's more in newborns and hibernating mammals. So it is mainly uh, play a role in thermoregulation. So it burns the energy. It burns the energy means having brown fat is good for our body. So white fat stores the energy, increases the obesity. Brown fat burns the energy and then it's good for uh, uh, our body. So uh, having more brown fat or uh, more beige fat in white fat uh, is going to like uh, uh, provide metabolic healthiness. So having more beige fat and brown fat is going to be like really good for our body. So if you look at adipogenic, adipogenic pathway, so, you know, these stem cells are like a, a, a precursor cells for many, all these different types of cell, cell types and tissues. So if you look at mesenchymal stem cells, so they have these uh, two different uh, possibilities. Either they can go into myogenic uh, pathway or uh, adipogenic pathway. If they go into adipogenic pathway with these um, uh, different uh, transcriptional factors, BMP2 and BMP4, they will be differentiated to pre-adipocytes with additional transcriptional factors, uh, PPR gamma 2 and CEBPs. And there are like three or four different types of CEBPs. Uh, they are going to get committed. Uh, they are going to get converted to Committed pre uh, committed white pre adipocytes. Can you see my cursor? Uh, no. Oh, you're not seeing my cursor. Oh, yes, yes, I can see now. Yes, can see. Oh, small. Okay. So uh, I've been working on a couple of, uh, not a couple of, um, uh, two different. You have a question for me? I... So if you look at like a, uh, these attention induced in inhibited proteins, so these are the like a group of proteins I discovered. So out there are like a eight uh, isoforms of this uh, particular protein uh, gene group. And out of those eight, I discovered four. And then uh, we showed like a uh, uh, short form for attention induced inhibited proteins. And, like, oh. tips. So tip three and tip six, they have uh, uh, roles in adipogenesis. So similarly, right now I'm working on another protein P311, which is associated in uh, adipogenesis. So once these committed white pre-adipocytes are formed, so they are going to get differentiated into mature cells, uh, white adipocytes. And recently more and more studies are being shown these white adipocytes, so when you have like this white fat, so the amount of uh, beige fat within this adipo, white fat is going to regulate metabolic healthiness. If you have like a, if you say this, uh, like a big mass of white fat, and if you find like a more brown beige fat inside compared to white fat, then that person is going to be like a metabolically healthy and they can regulate their uh, body weight. So similarly, if you look at the other pathway, so myogenic lineage, so cells will 
cells will differentiate in this pathway through like a, a transcriptional effect of these different hello can you hear me yes yes we can hear you but we cannot see your photo yeah something happened so i don't know so yeah. as long as you see the screen i'm fine with that yes yes so with these uh, different uh, transcriptional factors effects so these cells either they go into like these brown adipocyte differentiation or skeletal muscle uh, differentiation so technically the brown adipocytes and skeletal muscle even though like uh, they look totally completely different their triggers are the same and they spend the energy so overall if you look at here so if you find if you find any mechanism or any compound hello I'm sorry, I think uh, I'm sorry. So the primary goal to regulate right now, the current research um, uh, is focusing on to identify either internal factors or external factors that we can use to switch the trans differentiation of these white adipocytes into beige adipocytes or increasing the population of brown adipocytes in the body is one of the like a, a potential uh, mechanisms to control weight and uh, combat this overweight and obesity situations this is another slide so showing all these three different types of uh, uh, adipocytes white adipose tissue brown adipose tissue and uh, bj adipose tissue so just here i would like to like bring it to your attention so brown and beige adipocytes will have more mitochondria so because of that mitochondria the energy uh, uh, is going to be like uh, uh, spent rather than stored in these adipose tissues oops So if you look at this uh, timeline and the mechanisms of adipocyte development during uh, a, a person's life. So if you look at here, so adipocyte formation, differentiation uh, is going to take place from very early age, prenatal period, and the numbers will increase up to adolescence. So technically, if we have like a very, very good healthy habits, so the amount of fat adipocyte number is going to be just right at this age. So if we somehow like uh, tilt that balance of energy intake and expenditure uh, due to sedentary life or uh, um, inactivity, physical inactivities and uh, all that uh, with uh, increased uh, food ingestion, caloric intake, our high fat diets and all these things. So it can like affect the hypertrophy. It leads to the hypertrophy of the mature adipocyte. So hypertrophy, as you see in the bottom picture, bottom uh, picture. So mature adipocyte is reasonably smaller with increased input of energy. So it is going to like become larger and larger. And that is going to contribute like a significant uh, adipose tissue expansion, white adipose tissue expansion. So similarly, the number of adipocytes is also going to play a role. So if there are like a more number of uh, adipocytes because of hyperplasia of this uh, adipose tissue, so that is also going to cause uh, obesity. But as we go grow older and older, uh, so technically the white fat and belly fat is going to increase. And then uh, uh, during senescence, again, it is going to like a, a, a recede and brown fat function also going to recede during the senescence. So because the brown fat is going to like uh, um, lose its uh, uh, capacity uh, in thermogenesis because of so many changes uh, that comes with the senescence or aging, that is another thing that is going to like lead to uh, age associated metabolic disorders also. So we 
discussed this one. Uh, I already went through this picture before. So adipose tissue, uh, as I mentioned to you now, it's a um, uh, well-known fact that it is a uh, endocrine organ. It secretes so many different uh, uh, biomolecules, and they have like a, a very key roles in uh, metabolism as well as in inflammation. So, what are going to happen during weight gain? So, during weight gain, either hypertrophy or hyperplasia is going to take place, and accumulation of adipocytes, like more uh, adipocyte numbers or size, is going to cause this uh, weight gain, obesity. And slowly, some of the adipocytes they are not going to receive like a sufficient uh, nutrients and uh, uh, oxygen supply, just like in cancer. So cells started dying. So as shown in this uh, picture, you can see uh, the death of uh, some of these adipocytes uh, with the recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells. And then parallelly, brown adipogenesis, uh, brown adipose or beige adipose tissue activity is going to go down because this brown adipose tissue as well as beige adipose tissue can trans differentiate into white adipose tissue type. So, because of the energy, caloric intake, and the accumulation of more fat and everything, this brown fat loses its brownness, and then it starts like getting converted to white type. So, this leads to accumulation of uh, all these different parameters are going to like lead to the accumulation of extracellular matrix and fibrosis of the adipose tissue. And uh, as we already discussed, adipose tissue, white adipose tissue, as well as brown adipose tissue, especially white adipose tissue in this case, we are going to like say, it is going to like change its uh, adipokine secretions. So that is going to bring in all these met metabolic uh, derangements that you see in obese people or overweight people. So it is also associated with the inflammation, as I mentioned to you. So if you look at healthy fat, so in healthy fat, the macrophages are M2 type and they are anti-inflammatory type. So you find like a more anti-inflammatory situation there. But as it gets obese and obese, the fat is going to accumulate and that will become like a pro-inflammatory and start secreting. Uh, so the macrophages, they change into like a M1 type uh, macrophages and then they start secreting so many pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, like a TNF alpha interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 6 leading to so many inflammatory associated uh, uh, situations so what happens in beige adipocytes and brown adipocytes and why it is good so all of you might have studied uh, electron transport chain and you know very well about the electron transport chain what happens is whenever uh, there is like uh, uh, any uh, of these uh, different uh, free fatty acids are coming out of the lipid metabolism or um, carbohydrate metabolism, they will come into mitochondrial membranes. And so there, this TCA cycle and then beta oxidation is going to take place. And then where you see all that energy will be released in the form of uh, high energy electrons from these high energy molecules like NADPH and FADH2. So those are going to release, these high energy electrons are going to um, get transported from electron uh, transport chain carriers. So during the transport, like a chain um, uh, transfer, these electrons are going to release their energy and that energy will be utilized to create this proton gradient, right? So in regular situation, in any other tissue, this proton gradient, all these protons are going to come back uh, uh, into the mitochondria through ATP synthase and ATP will be synthesized. However, in beige and brown fat, so in beige and brown fat, what happens is these uh, protons, they are going to return or leak back inside into the mitochondria through uncoupling protein. So because of this, so during this process, all that energy that is uh, uh, coming out of this proton gradient will be released in the form of heat. 
that's how energy is being utilized so it's not stored so that is how come it is going to be like a, so helpful having more beige or brown fat or finding uh, 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 any drug that can convert this brown uh, the, uh, this white fat into beige adipose or brown adipose tissue is going to be helpful in the treatment of uh, overweight and obesity so there are so many different strategies to target obesity so either you can target at the digestion absorption level or you can target at adipogenic mechanisms like a, a proliferation and differentiation or conversion of this white fat into either beige fat or brown fat so this is another mechanism and uh, once you start like a convert like a focusing on trans differentiation of white adipose tissue uh, into beige fat or uh, brown fat so this is going to like a lead to thermogenic pathways and energy and uh, energy expenditure so this is another way of uh, uh, targeting obesity so why i'm giving you this is like a, if you know different levels where you can like really target so you can focus on identifying different uh, uh, drug candidates to target these different pathways so when it comes to treatment of uh, obesity as well as obesity associated metabolic diseases it is always balanced between white fat beige fat and brown fat so that's it so as long as you balance this so it is always like a, uh, you can manage the weight so let me switch back and uh, um, show you like a few slides uh, what's going on in my life so I am working on a protein known as P311. It is a small 80 kilo Dalton protein and uh, its uh, function is a relatively unknown when we started working on this a uh, few years ago. Uh, it doesn't have any known uh, protein motifs or uh, uh, domains other than this small pest motif that uh, target this particular protein to ubiquitin proteasomal degradation pa pathway. So we showed the presence of this protein in smooth muzzle and before as one of our collaborators showed uh, the presence of p311 in brain and uh, now we know a little bit more about this but uh, relatively um, its function is largely unknown so i showed the expression of p311 in arterial system so it's in uh, it's present in smooth muscle of arteries but not in veins so uh, we along with our collaborators we like uh, uh, procured these uh, p311 knockout mice i think uh, many of you might be knowing for the sake of students, I'm just going to tell you what these uh, knockout mice means. So at uh, embryonic single cell stage, zy zygote stage, so a particular gene, whatever we are interested in, whatever we want to study can be removed using technologies. So once it is removed, that uh, um, single cell zygote can be implanted into pseudo pregnant mice and it will be like a, a grown into baby and then this particular new mouse that is being generated will lack that gene of interest that we are interested in. So one of our collaborators developed this P311 knockout. So I procured them and started looking into uh, those animals. And this picture shows P311 is present in a wild type that is control mice, but it is not present in P311 knockout mice. And uh, so initially, because based on some of the initial studies that we were like uh, doing at the time, I predict, uh, I hypothesized that uh, this uh, protein might regulate blood pressure. It might have effect on blood pressure. So if you look at uh, uh, left side bottom corner, so you can see the mean blood pressures are uh, uh, like P three one one knockouts are hypotensive, hypotensive. So blood pressure is lower. So to verify that one, I checked. Uh, so what's going on uh, maybe because it's present in uh, smooth muscle of the blood vessels so i studied the contraction of these uh, blood vessels so using a myograph so when we uh, challenge this these iotas uh, that we collect from wild type or knockout mice as you can see wild type mice are can't their iotas are contracting really well uh, when we challenge with the different concentration of potassium, whereas knockouts, they are defective. So this initially gave us like some idea 
okay maybe this hypertension is because of the vascular contraction uh, defects that are um, uh, that we are seeing in knockout pulse so to make sure when we start talking about like iota iota again has a lot of different types of cells so to make sure it is mainly because of smooth muscle cells so we isolated specifically the smooth muscles smooth muscle cells from iotas and then we did uh, collagen contraction studies where we uh, mix these uh, uh, smooth muscle cells with collagen and make a gel so over the period of time like uh, within seven to eight days this gel will contract based on the uh, uh, contractile nature of the cells so if you see wild type smooth muscles contracted the gels very well whereas knockout mice uh, could not so uh, that tells like pretty much uh, uh, p311 presence in the vasculature is a, a key uh, in regulating uh, both vascular contractility as well as regulating blood pressure so and then we worked on like a lot of uh, other uh, cell signaling pathways and we showed that uh, uh, phosphorylation of MLC20, which is very important for uh, uh, contraction, uh, is uh, down-regulated. It is reduced in P311 knockouts, and uh, the enzyme that the kinase that phosphorylates MLCK is also down-regulated. So because of this, phosphorylation of MLC20 is going down, and because of this, contraction is defective. And what we observed is uh, uh, P311 knockouts showed decreased TGF beta 1, TGF beta 2, and TGF beta 3, both total and active. So we studied all these study, uh, all these things uh, in both uh, uh, IOTA tissue, so tissue level and also serum systematic level, showing that uh, P311 regulates. And further studies afterwards that we did, it clearly showed that P311 regulates the TGF beta expression uh, uh, at post-translational le level by uh, post-transcriptional level by binding to five prime and three prime uh, regions of that uh, transcripts and uh, uh, associated um, um, translation into proteins. So meanwhile, we generated P311 transgenic mice. Uh, so these transgenic mice, as you can see, they overexpress P311. So because they overexpress P311. P311 knockouts had a decrease in TGF beta. So we anticipated to see increased in TGF beta 1, TGF beta 2, and TGF beta 3. So pretty much all the tissues that we verified. So you see increased in TGF beta 1, beta, uh, beta 2, beta 3s. And these mice, if you look at the blood pressure, their blood pressure are increased. So these mice, P311 transgenics that overexpress P311 in uh, the tissues they are hypertensive so that clears like a p311 regulates blood pressure so we also verified this in human tissues so we collected tissues from normal tensile uh, uh, blood vessels from humans and hypertensive blood vessels from humans and verified for the p311 expression uh, by doing real-time pcr you can see increased p311 in these blood vessels uh, in the hypertensives, and also you can see the staining of uh, these blood vessels with P311 antibody. So more color, more brown color means more protein is present. So here you can clearly see. So while I was doing some of these studies, what I observed was the blood vessels, so between wild types and knockouts, they have different quantities of uh, perivascular fat. So if you look at like IOTA, IOTA will have like a, uh, a fat surrounding the blood vessel. So these blood vessels, I clearly saw that difference and I started like hypothesizing. Maybe these uh, um, P311 is also has a role in uh, uh, fat cell development. So initially I started like using these cell culture model where you can see these 3T3 L1 fibroblasts. So you take these cells and then uh, add adipogenic cocktail. It is a mix of three compounds, insulin, uh, dexamethasone and uh, um, isobutyl methylxanthine. So you add these three, and then within 10 days, they are going to differentiate into beautiful fat cells. So here, uh, lower uh, bottom, left side, bottom corner, you see like a 3T3L1 adipocytes, all that color, it's because of uh, 
I'll read of staining. So I'll read of uh, stain, it stains uh, neutral fat. That's uh, triglycerides that you see in uh, uh, lipids of these adipocytes. So this is a beautiful model to study any of these uh, um, uh, adipogenic pathway uh, mechanisms. So if you look at here on right side panel, so I differentiated these cells for different days and looked for like a P311 expression. As you can see, P311 expression is increasing with the inc uh, like a differentiation of these cells into adipocytes. And PPR gamma 2 and uh, uh, FABP, fatty acid binding protein 4. So these two are positive controls where you are expected to see more in adipocytes. So those, are, those two are positive controls. And then I tested the expression of this P311 for different days up to uh, 10, 13 days, and you clearly see the uh, levels are going up as the cells are um, as the cells are differentiating. And uh, PPR gamma is one of the key master regulator of adipogenesis, so it correlates with the expression of PPR gamma too. Uh, CBP alpha and CBP beta is like a, it is supposed to express like this. It initially it gets activated and then its um, levels goes down. So, so these are like a, this gave me some idea that P311 is uh, having some role in adipogenesis. So next I asked if I remove the P311 using some tool, SIRNA tool, uh, maybe is it going to like inhibit adipogenesis? So I used a SIRNA, Axel SIRNA, this is special type of SIRNA. So generally, uh, if we need to incorporate anything into the cell, we need to use a tool, a delivery tool. But this one, uh, it is made um, because of like whatever the proprietary technology they use. So we just add that one in, into the media, it automatically gets into the cell. I think they use it some HIV protein, TAT protein um, conjugation or something like that, but whatever it is. So it automatically self delivers into the adipocytes. So what happens in this particular system is as the cells start differentiating, more and more fat, uh, uh, like a lipids oil will be released into the media. So technically this system is very, very difficult uh, to deliver anything, but uh, this uh, self-delivering SIRNA uh, made my life easy. So I treated one set of groups with this SIRNA. So you can clearly see the P311 transcript levels went down, indicating that this SIRNA is uh, breaking down the P311 transcript. And then uh, when we compared the PPR gamma 2 levels are also going down, indicating that adipogenesis is being inhibited. And uh, you see all these uh, different uh, PPR gamma 1 and gamma 2, their levels are going down at uh, uh, protein level and P3 level, P311 level, protein level also went down significantly when we used this P311 SIRNA. And here you can clearly see uh, control SIRNA is uh, showing regular uh, adipogenesis. Whereas if you look at P311 SIRNA, where you expected to see less P311 transcripts and protein. So you see very, very less red color. So cells are, uh, um, um, adipogenic differentiation is inhibited here. So clearly that indicates P311 has a, a significant role in adipogenesis. So again, we added like, a, we incorporated more P311 by uh, 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 adding more P, uh, P311 to, into the, the 3 to 3, 3 to 3L1 adipocyte cell line. So if you see, there is a more adipogenesis is happening. So this is like a picture of all those uh, uh, different, this is uh, control SIRNA, this is P311 SIRNA, where you don't see P311 protein. Uh, this is a rosiglitazone, which is a, a PPR gamma activator. And then uh, uh, here we, incorporated, transfected with the PCP311. So more P311 is there. So red color indicates the adipocytes. So if you compare, this is normal. Here you see like a no adipogenesis because lack of P311 is inhibiting adipogenesis. Here you see more adipogenesis because more of P311 is inducing adipogenesis. And this is positive control. And uh, you see the same thing at protein level also. And I started asking, okay, now I know, so P311 plays a role in adipogenesis. So I started looking into uh, adipose tissue of uh, mice. 
whether P311 is present or not. So I verified subcutaneous white adipose tissue. And I also verified like other tissues like uh, gonadal, brown fat, um, as well as uh, perivascular fat. So P311 is uh, present in all these adipose tissues. So here on the top panel, you can see it is shown in immunohistochemistry using P311 antibody. In lower, po lower panels, you can see it's a shown in gre green fluorescence protein using P311 antibody conjugated to green fluorescent protein. So as you see in the panel C, in early adipocytes, you see like a less P311. And in mature adipocytes, you see more uh, P311. So what that tells is that during differentiation, as we saw in real-time PCR studies, as the cells are differentiating into mature uh, adipocytes, the P311 levels are going, increasing more and more. We tested with the, like a two different uh, uh, antibodies using. So uh, it's always in research, like uh, if you prove in more than one way, it's always like uh, um, better. Because P311 is, uh, its expression is uh, correlated with the PPR gamma expression. So I started hypothesizing maybe P311 is there, a, uh, whether it is playing any role in uh, uh, PPR gamma promoter regulation. So all of you know, if you take any gene here, you can see PPR gamma gene. So there will be a promoter region uh, upstream of this one. So any transcriptional factors that binds regulators or co-regulators, if they bind here, and then they activate PPR gamma gene, so then it is going to like activate adipogenic pathway because PPR gamma is a, a master regulator of adipogenesis. So I hypothesize that, that maybe P311 is a directly or indirectly binding to PPR gamma promoter. So if it is binding here, what you can expect? So uh, you expect to initiation of this transcription of this particular gene. So there are like a, a tools available where you can like instead of PPR gamma gene, you can replace this gene and put a luciferase gene that you can uh, uh, measure the luciferase activity. So I use this uh, uh, promoter reporter constructs where we have like uh, two different um, uh, reporter systems. One is luciferase, which you can uh, uh, measure the act as a transfection control. So we use this one. So I took this construct, I co-transfected with the P311, and also I co-transfected with the control uh, vector. So here you can see in the bottom panel. So this is control. So PPR gamma promoter reporter construct along with the control uh, plasmid. And the other one is a PPR gamma promoter construct with the P311 plasmid. So if you see, if you compare, so this one, P311 is a binding and activating luciferase. So you are seeing like a more signal. So this uh, gives uh, uh, proof, this is proof to show that P P311 is binding to PPR gamma promoter. So next I asked, so I, I checked by different method using, uh, using known as a cheap assays, chromatin and precipitation assays. If P311 is binding here, if you pull down the P311 using antibody, so if you pull down the P311 using a P311 antibody, so you are going to pull down this particular gene. And if you amplify using primers uh, for this particular specific for this particular uh, gene promoter, so if you amplify that tells the protein is binding to the promoter. If it doesn't amplify, it tells it is not binding. So I did chromatin immunoprecipitation assays. So in this chromatin immunoprecipitation assays, one group is transfected with the PCDNA. Second group is uh, transfected with the P311. And then I pulled down both of them using P311 antibody. And I amplified for PPR gamma promoter. I amplified for this particular promoter. So you can clearly see this is getting amplified. That means P311, in fact, is binding. So I'm showing in like a two or three different ways, uh, clearly that P311 binds to PPR gamma to promoter, uh, and then it is activating PPR gamma 2, which is like a master regulator of adipogenesis. So that is one of the pathways 
So P311 regulating adipogenesis. So further studies like we uh, because nobody knows the structure of P311, we started looking at the structure of P311 and using uh, um, these are bioinformatic tools. Uh, and then we identified that uh, it belongs to a group of proteins known as a intrinsically disordered protein. So intrinsically disordered proteins are a special group of proteins. They lack the secondary structure to minimum level. So, you know, the secondary structure, either alpha helix or beta pleated structures are very, very key in the function of these proteins, their structure and function of these proteins. And uh, intrinsically disordered proteins will have like a very low level of this uh, uh, secondary structure that will give them uh, a special advantage so they can bind to different groups of molecules across different pathways. And uh, one of our studies also showed that uh, um, uh, this P311 forms complexes also, like a trimers, hexamers, and uh, that was supported by um, uh, this um, recombinant protein that we uh, uh, expressed and purified in bacterial system, as well as uh, endogenous 3T3L1 uh, pre-adipocytes and adipocytes. In both cases, we were able to like see these monomers and trimers. So overall, uh, at this stage, what I can say is, of course, I'm not showing a lot of data. So um, P311 knockout mice. They are not showing any changes in white fat at early age. But when I did age mediated studies at 12 month age, they are obese. Knockout mice are obese. That is pretty interesting because so far I'm whatever the data I'm showing. So it, uh, it is pretty clear P311 is inducing adipogenesis. But the more uh, recent studies in my lab shows that P311 it induces adipogenesis, but at the same time, it induces more BG adipogenesis. So when I studied, like I look, looked at the uh, white fat of both wild type and knockout mice, in knockout mice, there, are, there is like a very less beige fat depots compared to wild types. And the P311 knockouts, they are diabetic. So their glucose levels are higher. Just last week, I started doing like a, a glucose tolerance test and the insulin tolerance test. It is pretty, pretty, pretty clear that P311 is involved in tilting the balance between white fat into beige fat. So they are playing a major role here. And also it is regulating PPR gamma two levels uh, by inducing these different pathways. And uh, very recent studies from my lab also shows that uh, uh, P311 also regulating UCP1 transcription. So uh, that manuscript is under preparation. Hopefully you are going to see that uh, very soon. So when it comes to medicinal plants and treatment, uh, so you know, there are so many success stories for the medicinal plants. So Risarpin, Metformin, which is like a, uh, first drug that will be uh, proposed for or uh, prescribed for diabetes, statins to uh, treat uh, hypercholesteremia. So there are like a curcumin, it is more popular now, like a, there are like a million papers published so far on curcumin. So if you look at all these like a different uh, plant, uh, different drugs, so uh, there are like so many success stories coming out because the statins metformin research. So the examples presented here, all of them, they are uh, like identified from uh, medicinal plants only. I, I think metformin is from uh, uh, Galiga officinalis, uh, Meshusrungi, they call it. So since my graduate days, I have been big fan of like yes. uh, uh, studying medicinal plants. So at that time, nobody was like really doing any medicinal plants work at ASU University. Uh, I literally begged my uh, PhD guide to allow me to work on this and uh, even though he's a completely clinical uh, person, so he accepted uh, to let me work on medicinal plants. And since then, I, I screened and worked on like a 25 plants in collaboration with my PhD mentor continuously. And we identified like so many different new compounds and uh, known compounds from different plants shown here. 
So we identified uh, MCY protein, uh, anti-diabetic protein from Mamadika Semal area. And then uh, cinnamic acid, it's a well-known anti-diabetic compound. We isolated from uh, Shizizima alternate for you. And we also identified a new, uh, like a drug from this one, compound from this one with uh, anti-diabetic property, Pterocarpus antlinus. Of course, uh, recently, all of you might have seen Pushpa movie. So that's all about this Pterocarpus antlinus. So, Rakta Sandhanam. And then Terminalia pallida, um, we study like uh, anti-diabetic property of Terminalia pallida. And right now I'm studying anti-lipidemic activity of this Terminalia pallida. It is having like a very wonderful anti uh, lipidemic as well as anti obesity effect. So soon you might like uh, uh, see uh, my publications. And uh, this is Anisomelis mal malabarica. So this is very interesting. We found like more than one compound, uh, like a, a group of compounds, like a five, six different compounds uh, from this uh, Anisomelis malabarica. So it has like a very potent anti diabetic and anti lipidemic activity. And the past year, year and a half, uh, I've been training my students uh, to find out uh, potential uh, prophylactic as well as a therapeutic treatment for COVID-19. And uh, we have been like uh, doing so much of work on Tinospora, Cardifolia, and Glyceriza Glabra, two compounds. Uh, I think both of them are in uh, Anandaya medicine. So we identified like a significant number of compounds showing uh, uh anti uh covid 19 activity uh, by uh, so some of these compounds are binding to spike protein of the virus and some of them are binding to uh, the rbrp rna dependent rna polymerase which is associated with uh, uh, genome uh, replication uh, in the host cells so, and uh, recently we isolated a compound known as Bahinia statin from Bahinia purpurea, and we published that one in uh, very recently in Frontiers in Pharmacology. So, I've been uh, doing this medicinal plants work for some time, and we made like so many discoveries. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of money to like uh, file patents, we just keep publishing. This is the problem. Security system is a headache. Okay. So, coming to the medicinal plants aspect, there are like so many phytochemicals uh, already being like a, a tap to look into uh, like whether they can be a, a better treatment options for uh, these obesity. So, if you look at like a uh, there are some plants uh, reported uh, to act at the level of uh, uh, pancreatic lipase. So some of the compounds isolated from these plants. So they have uh, inhibitory action on pancreatic lipase. Similarly, some are having anti-appetite uh, 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 activity. So technically, these compounds are going to reduce the appetite. They reduce or uh, uh, repress the appetite. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I think your time is also done, right? Yes, over. So okay. uh, similarly, so we have like uh, other uh, different uh, plant sources where they are having like uh, effect on energy expenditure, adipocyte differentiation. So, and there are like more and more uh, plant uh, studies are coming out where the mechanism is unidentified. So, so what I mean to say is like there, there is like a lot of information is available, and if we can like focus on that one, it will be uh, more helpful. So, when you work on these uh, uh, in this particular field, like you have different models to work on. So, cell culture model is there. Mouse models are there. Again, in mouse models also there are genetic models and high fat diet induced models. And this is zebra fish model is a very, very interesting, uh, which is not going to cost a lot. So with uh, very minimum resources, so one can like a uh, plan on studying these uh, in these lines. So of course, the clinical studies, human studies are always like uh, at the fag end after we prove safety. So we know there are like uh, OBOB mice and DBDB mice, 
where you can study obesity and diabetes and all these things. So these are like a few examples. Their uh, 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 mechanism of action is already shown. So the, these are going to be really helpful if uh, anybody is uh, planning to work on these lines. So one beauty of medicinal plants is uh, majority of plants they will be they will be they will be they will have additional benefits also. So with that, I'm going to. Uh, thank you all, my team, my mentors, and all of you for listening. Uh, and then I'm going to stop there. Uh, my funding resources, I thank very much. And then I stop there if you have any questions. Thank you, Dr. Kamaisarabad. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, lucid presentation. Uh, you have uh, described explanatory about uh, the treatment of obesity and the ABCs of obesity generation and uh, uh, the various uh, treatment options and the research, uh, uh, the, what we are doing by targeting the P311, uh, targeting to PPR gamma uh, in the process of uh, adiposynthesis and various uh, plant, plant as well as the plant isolates uh, that are uh, useful in uh, preventing the adipogenesis and thereby in uh, preventing uh, the obesity. He excellently described that. Now the topic is uh, open for uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. So, Bhatri, yeah. I saw two questions in the chat from Dr. Sri Gatta from Philadelphia. Can you address these questions? May read the question. Yeah, yeah. This, is, yeah. I, uh, this, this is Sri. I can uh, uh, first of all thanks for the presentation. It's really good. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like you presented uh, your conduit arteries uh, data. Just wondering, have you done anything with the uh, resistance arteries, like mesenteries? That's my first question. And second thing is like, are there any correlation with the perivascular fat that you are showing with the you know, basic things like hypertriglyceridemia, triglyceridemia? Dr. Badri? Can you, can you hear me, Krishna? Yes, I can hear. Hello, sir. Can you answer the questions? Two questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Gatta is going to address your questions. Please. Thank you. Uh, first yeah. of all, thanks to Dr. Professor Annapurna you know, for educating all of us and then congrats for her superannuation. I just want to mention Dr. Sri Gatta was uh, studied B pharmacy in uh, in my batch actually from 1994 to 1999 and later went to the Masters of Pharmacy at Naipur, the pharmacology department and then uh, and did PhD in, he did PhD in uh, NDSU, North Dakota State University. Now he's working as a director for uh, Company, I'm not sure. Some Sorry, Dr. Dr. Yeah, hello, uh, Dr. Srinivas Gatta. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Uh, uh, Srinivas, just, uh, for all of you, just I want to uh, uh, introduce uh, our uh, uh, sorry, sir, here, Professor S. Yeah. Our sir, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, can, we can talk to him. Friends, how are you? Thank you. How are you? How are you? Gatta, you can talk to Dr. Satnarayan, Professor Satnarayan. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sasan. How are you? I, we are we're doing good, sir. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, I had oh, COVID. Nice to see you. I had COVID, but I recovered from that. I have sir? COVID, oh, sir. Oh. I recovered from that. 
Great, sir. Very, very good to hear, sir. Uh, <laughs> nice that you are talking about uh, herbal drugs. Hmm? You are talking about herbal drugs. And he has just uh, shared his uh, great presentation, <laughs> sir. Uh, yeah. Our all, all the friends. Our all the friends. First, myself, sir. Namaskaram, Andi. Ning Krishnamurti Boini, me student, Andi. Uh, I hope you remember. How are you, sir? How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I met your brother-in-law last week in Houston. He was the education secretary. I'm not sure his name, but uh, he was in Houston right now with us. And we attended the puja, puja, and he got a COVID last week. Yeah. yeah he's, Houston, Houston. Houston, 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 Texas. Houston, Texas. Me brother in London. Me education secretary, yes, retired. Education secretary, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Uh, what is his name? Idiot. He didn't remember. I didn't remember. Uh, okay. Idra was alone, Trendy. While you can only put plus thank you. It's okay. Uh -huh. Okay, sir, we will talk this later. Information we will talk. Krishna yeah. Kumar. Sir, how are you, sir? I am doing fine. <laughs> I came to your lab also. Sir, uh, so next I am going to present. I uh, will be happy if you stay there for a couple of uh, minutes at least during my presentation. I will be here till the session is over. Oh, excellent. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay. Right. Uh, right. I, I gave a lecture at your lab. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. You came okay. here and uh, you stayed at our home and uh, we, ah, yeah. we, yeah. we still uh, have those memories. Yes, very good. Yes, sir. So, uh, shall we start uh, the next uh, session? Sir, I think so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Shungumar. Yes, I, now I request uh, Dr. Murli Krishna Kumar to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Krishnumar Veerawalli, please, Murli. Good morning to all of you. Uh, now I take the privilege to introduce uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Krishnumar Veerawalli. Dr. Veerawalli received his PhD in Pharmaceutical Sciences under the supervision of Professor Annapurna Madam from Andhra University in 2005. After completion of his PhD, he worked at, for three years as a scientist in Ranbaxi Laboratories. He then moved to the University of Illinois, the College of Medicine, Peora, uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in 2007. He was promoted to research assistant professor in 2010 and later on as assistant professor in 2014. And uh, last year, in 2020, he became an associate professor with tenure. And he is also taking care of uh, the animal care program and has joined appointments in pediatrics, neurosurgery, neurology, biomedical sciences, health sciences, and educational departments at UIC. His, the research focus of Dr. Beravalli's lab is to investigate the molecular and cellular mechanisms of post-stroke brain damage and test the efficacy of novel treatments to attenuate brain injury and promote recovery after ischemic stroke. His current research is funded by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke of the NIH. He has been teaching pharmacology to MD students at UIC for over a decade. Dr. Veerwalli has received several prestigious and highly competitive fellowships and awards for his accomplishments as a student, educator and researcher. To date, Dr. Veerwalli has published 57 research and review articles in peer-reviewed high-impact scientific journals and trained over 30 pre- and post-doctoral fellows. He is an active member of several national and international scientific associations and societies, and he has delivered several invited talks at other universities and scientific conferences. He has been serving on several editorial boards and grant reviewing study sections and I, along with all the people i am also eagerly waiting to hear his talk titled brain damage after ischemic stroke role of tpa so 
I thank the organizers for letting me introduce my senior Krishna Kumar. And uh, uh, now you can, I think the, the seminar can start. Thank you. Now you can start, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Dr. Murali, for your uh, nice uh, introduction, uh, happy to hear you for a long time. <laughs> Let me share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. So, do I have one hour from now? I'm yeah. starting late. 45 minutes. Okay. Uh, the topic of uh, today's talk is uh, brain damage after stroke, especially ischemic stroke and role of TPA. So the contents of my talk uh, will be an introduction to stroke. I'll talk about what is stroke and what are the problems that we see after stroke, how dangerous it is, and what are the current treatments we have, and what are the limitations with the current treatments, why we need additional research, and uh, I will share uh, some of the results of my research on TPA, especially brain TPA. And finally, I will summarize and conclude. So every, every organ in our body needs blood supply. You know why we need blood supply? To get oxygen and nutrients. So every organ in the body needs blood supply to get oxygen and nutrients. Like every other organ, brain also needs constant supply of blood. And a stroke occurs when blood circulation to the brain fails. So that means if there is no blood circulation to the brain, that end up with stroke. Okay. The same way a person suffering with the loss of blood flow to his heart is said to be having a heart attack. A person suffering with loss of blood flow to his brain can said to be having a brain attack or a stroke. I know many people, they confuse for uh, stroke. Uh, stroke is uh, related to the brain. So brain attack or stroke are the same, but a heart attack is not stroke. Okay. Stroke is related to brain. So we learned that like stroke is the failure of blood circulation to the brain, right? So if the failure of blood circulation to the brain in stroke is because of blockade of blood flow, we call it an ischemic stroke. Here you can see in this image, there is a clot at the junction. It is blocking the blood flow to this blood vessel. That means if this blood vessel is going to the brain, that ends up, that end up with stroke. And here you can see there is atherosclerotic plaques formed at the junction of this artery, and there is no blood flow to this branch. If this branch is supplying blood to the brain, that means it ends up with stroke. So if the failure of blood circulation is because of this blockade, we call it ischemic stroke. And if the failure of blood circulation is because of rupture of blood vessels in the brain, that ends up with bleeding, we call it hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. And the most common cause of hemorrhagic stroke is uncontrolled hypertension. Those patients who are uh, taking uh, medications for uh, antihypertensive medications for hypertension, they need to really monitor whether their tablet, the tablets they are taking are really reducing the blood pressure and keeping the their blood pressure in the normal range. If they are not working, they can damage the small micro vessels in the brain and that ends up with stroke. And ischemic stroke accounts for almost 85% of all the cases and the area of my interest is ischemic stroke. And the good news is strokes can be prevented. 80% of all strokes can be prevented. I will talk about that in the next slide. We all know that it is our right brain that controls the left side of our body, and it is the left brain that controls the right side of our body. And if a stroke damages the right brain, the left side will be disabled. 
For example, if you ask a person to raise both the hands, if that person is not able to raise one hand, meaning that there is a stroke in the brain. So here in this illustration, this lady is not going to raise her right hand, meaning that he, she has stroke on the left brain. Okay. And it is our brain that controls our vision, our speech, our balance, our behavior, sensations, and emotions. And if a stroke damages a particular part of this brain, that area may no longer work as it did before a stroke, which can lead to symptoms like a trouble in walking, weakness on one side of the body, and even trouble seeing and even trouble speaking. So all the stroke patients may not have all these symptoms. The symptoms you see in a patient depends on the area at which the stroke occurred in that patient. Stroke is one of the leading causes of death in the USA. If we go by the numbers, currently in the United States, it is the fifth leading cause of death. But globally, stroke is the second leading cause of death. And every 40 seconds, someone has a stroke. And one in four strokes are in people who have had a previous stroke. And about 55,000 more women than men have a stroke each year. But if you see this number before the menopause, this number is different because uh, women are protected with estrogens. So the incidence of severity of stroke damage in females is less compared to men before the menopause. But after the menopause, the protective effects of estrogens are lost and uh, that ends up with uh, increasing the incidence and severity in females. And as I said earlier, 80% of all strokes can be prevented. As explained by Dr. Uh, Kameshwar Badri, Obesity, if you can control obesity, you can reduce the risk of stroke. You don't need to worry about these problems because uh, obesity is one of the main risk factors for stroke. It is not only the leading cause of death. It is the main reason for uh, long-term disabilities, serious long-term disabilities in uh, stroke patients. Stroke survivors are currently living with uh, devastating neurological deficits. So in stroke, there is a blockade in the blood vessel, especially, especially ischemic stroke. So when there is an, a blockade in the blood vessel of the brain, the affected brain tissue can be described as having two regions, the core region and the penumbra region. The core region is considered the dead tissue because there is a completely zero blood supply here. That means zero oxygen, zero nutrients. So the cells will die immediately. So this is called the core tissue. But the area of the brain tissue around this core is called the penumbra. That means this penumbra tissue will have some collateral circulation and uh, some supply of blood from the collaterals. Okay, so we consider the brain tissue in the penumbra as a dying tissue and the research is mainly focused now to reduce the dying tissue after uh, ischemic stroke you can see there is a core region and there is a penumbra region and if you immediately remove this block, if the patient reaches hospital in time, this block can be removed. If it is removed, it is fine. But if the removal of this blockade is delayed for two hours, you can see the core region is increased. And uh, if you can't remove this block in the patient, even after 12 hours, all the area, penumbra area is occupied by the core. That means it is irrecoverable. That means all the tissue will become dead. You can't rescue that. So it is priority to remove this block in the stroke patients as soon as they reach the hospital. Okay. Each minute the treatment is delayed to unblock the blood vessel. 
the patient will lost approximately 2 million brain cells and the time lost is brain lost okay so now we learned that ischemic stroke means there is a blockade in the blood vessel it can be atherosclerotic plaques or the clots blood clots that can block the blood supply so whatever is the case when there is a blockade in the blood vessel we call it ischemic stroke and the good news is we have a treatment available to remove the block from the blood vessel we have tpa which is called tissue plasminogen activator that was approved by fda in 1996 but unfortunately you have to give this tpa treatment within 4.5 hours of symptom onset if the patient reach hospital after this 4.5 hours he is not eligible for this tpa treatment so even if the patient reach hospital one hour after symptom onset if we fail to diagnose that the patient has stroke ischemic stroke and if we fail to administer tpa that patient will lost the benefits of tpa treatment and how this tpa works it is a simple mechanism so tpa converts the inactive plasminogen to active plasmin that breaks the clot into small pieces so here you can see this clot is broken into small pieces when this is broken into small pieces there is a blood flow re established that is called reperfusion we are reperfusing the blood vessel by removing the block right so reperfusion is supposed to produce or result in therapeutic benefit but unfortunately if you look at the mechanisms reperfusion of the artery will lead to sudden or a change in the intracellular ph which can cause reactive oxygen species generation and increase in intracellular calcium overload and one or all of these mechanisms will eventually lead to apoptosis a disruption of cell structure and death so now you can ask me okay when reperfusion is causing the damage then why are you reperfusing why should we give tpa treatment right that question should make sense so if you see in this uh, illustration this is the depth of ischemic injury okay if you remove the block you end up with this much reperfusion injury so this is the ischemic injury and this is the reperfusion injury but if you don't remove the block here you end up with more damage okay although reperfusion is causing some damage if you don't cause reperfusion if you don't remove the block you end up with more damage there is a reperfusion salvage that is the reason we go for reperfusion and tpa treatment has several limitations because it has a very tight time window within 4.5 hours you have to administer it to the patients but unfortunately only 3 to 5% of patients reach hospital in time to be considered for this treatment and tpa treatment is not good for patients with bleeding disorders because it is breaking the clot right it is preventing the clot formation or breaking the clot thrombolytic agent so it should not be given to patients with bleeding disorders and unfortunately this tpa is able to remove the block but when there is a block until the block is removed there are some brain cells dead and there are some dying cells around that uh, core tissue this tpa treatment is not going to address any brain damage that occurs here when there is a block and when there is when the block is removed so it doesn't address the brain damage that occurs due to reperfusion and unfortunately there is very little or no functional outcome in 50% of patients receive who receive tpa treatment right so it is a good news we have treatment available but it has several limitations to remove the block right but there is no treatment available to reduce the brain injury that occurs when there is a block and brain injury occurs that is reperfusion injury 
after the block is removed and to reduce the disability and promote recovery we do not have any treatments tpa was discovered 20 years ago 1996 after that lot of research has been done but none of the treatments that were proven successful in preclinical studies reached the clinic in the clinical studies most of the treatments that were successful in preclinical studies were failed so when i am going through the literature i found a paper that was published in nature medicine regarding the tissue plasminogen activated tpa that increases neuronal damage after focal cerebral ischemia in wild type mice and tpa deficient mice wild type mice means these are the normal mice tpa deficient mice means this mice there is no tpa gene okay so in these uh, animals they induce ischemia and reperfusion three hours ischemia and one day reperfusion so in the wild types where there is tpa they found that uh, lytic activity like zymography assay they did so this lytic activity indicates there is tpa in the brain but in tpa deficient animals you don't see that lytic activity why because there is no tpa that means tpa in the brain is causing some lysis in the brain so this experiment indicates there is increased endogenous tpa activity in the brain following an ischemic stroke so this uh, you should not get confused with uh, the tpa i am talking in the brain so we are giving tpa to remove the block that is exogenously we are giving tpa that is exogenous tpa but what the tpa i am talking in now is the tpa that is released in the brain when there is a block and after removal of the block there is tpa in the brain that is endogenous tpa now one words i will call it brain tpa okay so uh, based on that paper i have seen that paper was published 20 years ago and after that there were no treatments or no discoveries made or no attempts made to develop any to find what is the role of the tpa and what is the uh, any treatments that can mitigate the tpa if they can improve the damage or cause recovery so i got interested in that and we wanted to see how long this tpa is expressed in the brain after stroke and uh, how much expression we can see in the brain after stroke so he is our uh, uh, postdoc currently working in my lab he is dr Ch challa uh, he is siva reddy he worked uh, with uh, dr anapurna madam he is a phd student he worked uh, in um, like before he joined my lab 3 years ago he was the head of the department of pharmacology at siddhartha college of pharmaceutical sciences and uh, he has lot of passion for uh, research and he quit that career he was uh, settled uh, almost like uh, 10 years after phd he was head of the department but i was surprised when he uh, conveyed his interest to me for uh, his passion for research and he was in touch with me for almost 5 6 years and uh, i got the opportunity and i got some funding from uh, national institute of health and i recruited him 3 years ago he is working very hard so i will show you all his exp the experiments he did so before we test uh, whether there is tpa is increased in the brain or not we have to induce stroke in the animals but the normal animals uh, we have to induce stroke in the normal animals how should we induce stroke so we have to block the blood vessel right so this is the arterial system in the rat this is a common carotid artery bifurcated into external and internal carotid and internal carotid artery goes up to here and it bifurcates into middle cerebral artery and i want to block this blood vessel okay because you can ask me why you are targeting only this blood vessel why not other blood vessels because this is the artery that is mostly blocked in most of the patients that uh, end up with uh, ischemic stroke and uh, reach hospital so our goal is to block the blood supply to this region but when we open the uh, ventral side in the neck region of the rat we can see only this part common carotid artery bifurcated into internal and external so we can't see this region so i want to block this if if i want to block this artery it is simple just put a knot be, behind that 
and then simply make a knot you can block the blood supply but unfortunately i want to block the blood vessel here so what we did we purchased some uh, silicon rubber coated filaments and uh, it's a microvascular surgery procedure we have to do this surgery while watching through the microscope uh, so we have to send this uh, filament through the external carotid artery through the internal carotid artery until it reaches the origin of the middle cerebral artery then it can block the blood supply to this middle cerebral artery it is a very complicated procedure and very few people very few labs in the country are able to do this procedure and uh, well, fortunately we were able to establish this method in our lab so after we established that method we induced ischemia for 2 hours in the rats and after 2 hours i remove the filament that constitutes reperfusion it's like a tpa treatment in humans so after 2 hours i remove this uh, filament that causes reperfusion so i can see ischemic injury and reperfusion injury in the animals but after reperfusion we assess the animal for stroke symptoms if we don't see the stroke symptoms in the animal we exclude those animals only those animals that show stroke symptoms will be included in the study and at different time points after stroke we euthanize these animals and collect the brains in the brains uh, we did uh, mrna analysis it's a real time pcr analysis you can see that mrna expression of tpa is increased several fold one day after stroke and three days after stroke and five days after stroke and you can see over a period of time there is a gradual increase and you can see the delta fold over sham on the y axis so that means it's almost eight fold increase on day 1 but it is almost near to 20 and near to 40 on fifth day after reperfusion but interestingly on day 7 it came to normal that means in the first 5 days the tpa is going up this is at the rna level we also did western blot analysis to see if the same result is repeated in the protein because at the end of the day the mrna whatever the tpa mrna that is synthesized in the brain has to be converted into tpa protein so similar to the mrna result what we have seen here you can see the protein expression of tpa is increased from day 1 to day 5 and then on day 7 it is comparable to the sham animals so whatever we have seen at the rna level we have seen at the protein level so during ischemic stroke uh, we are clear now that tpa brain tpa is increased so what is this tpa doing in the brain and what which cells in the brain are releasing this tpa so based on the literature we learned that like neuro, neuronal cells in the brain they release tpa and this tpa can be neuroprotective and can be detrimental to the brain so there are certain mechanisms that are <coughs> showing that tpa in the brain is useful but at the same time the tpa can activate mmps that can cause the degradation of the blood brain barrier so bbb breakdown will lead to infiltration of blood cells into the brain and leading to inflammation and tpa in the brain can also activate this microglia and uh, astrocytes other brain cells that can lead to m1 polarization release of pro inflammatory mediators followed by inflammation so it is like a double edged sword like tpa brain tpa it is clear that brain tpa is increased at the same time that brain tpa has both beneficial and deleterious effects so we hypothesize that the potential deleterious effects of tpa outweigh its beneficial actions and therefore <laughs> elevated brain tpa after stroke may contribute to brain damage and retards recovery okay this is what we hypothesize we don't know until we block the tpa and see uh, what is what is the outcome we don't know what is the uh resultant effect net effect we don't know there are positive and negative effects so we want to block the tpa in the brain how to block tpa how to prevent tpa elevation in the brain following stroke that is our immediate uh, next question and uh, here in this picture you can see dr chelboyna he is our uh, pharmacy student he did his uh, masters in pharmacognosy and a phd in pharmacognosy with dr s ganapati garu at andhra university 
and I, immediately after his postdoc uh, phd he moved to my lab and he was with me for almost 6 years and he moved in 2018 to the university of wisconsin and uh, right currently he is working as a assistant scientist at university of wisconsin he did wonderful work in the lab he published several first order papers in high impact journals okay so we want to prevent uh, brain tpa how can we do that so we prepared tpa shrna you you have seen in the previous presentation by dr kam misra badri that he used sirnas to silence the target genes so here we used shrna technology to silence the target gene tpa in this case our target gene is tpa we want to block tpa in the brain so we all know that it's a transcription causes the synthesis of tpa mrna from dna and translation will cause tpa protein synthesis i don't want to wait until the tpa protein is formed there may be some uh, tpa serine protease inhibitors that can block tpa but i don't want to wait until then because if you look at the tpa half life it is only 5 to 10 minutes that means as soon as the tpa protein uh, released in the brain it can start its effect it can activate mmps it can cause bbb damage so i don't want the protein to be formed i want to block the synthesis of protein so i want to target mrna so that is why i prepared shrna that uh, i can show you in the next slide the mechanism how it works this shrna can enter into the cells if this is the cell membrane and then it can get enter into the nucleus and prepare pre shrna is synthesized in the nucleus which will be released into the cytoplasm in the cytoplasm geyser breaks this uh, pre shrna into sirnas and this sirna can bind to target mrna and cleave that mrna so if this mrna is destroyed there is no question of tpa protein synthesis that is how our tpa shrna works so after uh, constructing this shrna and synthesizing shrna plasmids before we test whether this uh, silencing tpa by shrna is able to reduce brain damage we need to know whether the tpa shrna is able to reduce tpa expression so that means whether it is efficacious in reducing the tpa expression we have to see so for that we these are the pc12 cells these are rat uh, pheochromocytoma cells and these are rat uh, c6 glioma cells in these cells we transfected a tpa shrna when you transfect with the tpa shrna here the tpa sh indicates tpa shrna when you transfect with tpa shrna you can see the mrna expression of tpa is going down see here in c6 cells also you can see when tpa sh is uh, transfected tpa mrna expression is going down meaning that our tpa shrna is working it is doing its job so it is at the mrna level so we also tested at the protein level pc12 cells the same rat pc12 cells we did like a, we have untreated cells and control shrna treated cells and tpa shrna treated cells and here you can clearly see that the protein expression of tpa shrna or tpa protein is reduced indicating that our tpa sh is working right these results uh, indicating that our tpa sh is effective in reducing tpa expression in vitro but in vivo is it able to reduce the tpa expression in the brain brain tpa expression so in order to test that what we did we took a couple of animals and uh, we gave 1.5 hour stroke that is ischemia and cause reperfusion and immediately after reperfusion we administered tpa sh intravenously to the animal it is administered as a nanoparticle formulation because tpa sh rna is uh, cannot enter into the cells as such so we make a nanoparticle formulation and administered intravenously so that this can go to the brain and can enter into the brain because after stroke there is a disruption of blood brain barrier these uh, molecules can easily enter and moreover there's a, those are nanoparticles they can easily get into the cells and do their job so one day after that uh, treatment we euthanized the animals and again we did the immuno blot on the brain sec brains we collected from the my rats and here also we can see in tpsh treated rats completely 
almost it is disappeared the tpa protein expression it is significantly reduced here you can see compared to the untreated animals these results indicate that the drug or the the drug molecule we prepared like the tpa shrna it is a shrna therapeutics i can call it it is not a synthetic molecule so uh, see it's not a synthetic inhibitor it is a um, shrna therapy i can say so it's this uh, shrna drug is effective in reducing tp expression in vivo <laughs> so now our next question is okay now the tp shrna we discovered it is doing its job now we want to see if this tp sh is able to reduce brain damage so we did the same uh, group of animals we gave ischemia and administered tpsh and one day after we euthanized the animal and we did the ttc staining so these are the animals from different groups these are the brain sections we made a 2 mm brain sections and incubated these sections in a uh, chemical called ttc triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride it is a simple uh, redox indicator so the live cells the containing dehydrogenases can convert this ttc into a red formogen pigment but the dead cells that doesn't have dehydrogenases they cannot convert the ttc into red pigment so they stay in pale color so whatever the red color you see here is the live tissue and the pale color you see is the dead tissue okay so we did this uh, in both male and female animals we want to see is, if there is a, there are any sex differences in the outcome so in, you can see in the males and females in untreated animals there is a lot of damage here but in uh, tpsh treated animals this uh, damage is reduced this pale color is reduced so we have n is equal to 6 uh, uh, in each group and we quantified the infarct volume and you can see in both in males and females tpsh is able to reduce brain damage okay so preventing brain tp elevation reduces brain damage that is what we uh, inferred from this experiment so breakdown of blood brain barrier is one of the primary events that occur following ischemic stroke and uh, in this picture you can see uh, these are the cerebral micro vessels uh, endothelial these are the endothelial cells that form the cerebral micro vessels so these endothelial cells in the brain are tightly packed to each other uh, with the help of these tight junctions that is the reason in the brain the blood uh, the contents in the blood cannot be leaked into the brain these endothelial cells are tightly packed and these tight junction proteins like occludin zo1 and claudin5 they keep these cells very tight so that the blood contents cannot leak into the brain but after uh, ischemia what happens there is a degradation of these protein suckers so these proteins are degraded when these proteins are degraded so these there will that means these are simply making knot like uh, they are connecting the endothelial cells if these proteins are degraded these uh, the blood cells or blood contents will be leaked into the brain and uh, if you look at uh, this uh, illustration in the left side you can see after ischemia and hypoxia so you can see after 0 uh, hour 3 hour 6 hours and 24 hours for a period of time how the molecules are changing in the brain there are several mmps that are activated like mmp2 mmp3 mmp9 all these mmps mmp means matrix mat matrix metalloproteinase they degrade the proteins we talked about uh, occludin zo1 and uh, uh, claudin5 right those are the proteins these are the mmps they have the capability to degrade those proteins they can break down they can cleave those proteins and there is uh, like a, there is a question like uh, plasmin is involved in the activation of these mmps right and the plasminogen is activated to plasmin by tpa so the elevated brain tpa can activate plasmin which can which can uh, eventually activate mmps which can cause bbb disruption bbb breakdown so when you suppress this brain tpa by silencing the gene using our shrna drug we can prevent this bbb disruption right that is what my hypothesis is so does the elevated brain tpa 
disrupt uh, blood brain barrier disruption so here you can see dr koteshwar uh, nalamulu in this uh, uh, image so he is a uh, masters uh, he did his masters in uh, andhra university with uh, professor assan garu and then he did his phd in pharmaceutical uh, uh, i think pharmaceutics with uh, dr k p r choudhary garu and then he moved to he worked as a, a lecturer in uh, geetam college i think and then he moved to malaysia he he reached very big positions in malaysia he was almost settled he has uh, elder kids who are going to high school now so like a couple of years ago he expressed his interest uh, to work in the lab and he is a passion for interest i i was really surprised why, uh, we have some uh, people who has really passion has passion for research but they end up in the teaching field or in india doing something but they, they after even after they settled well they are trying to explore for the opportunities uh, and they want to uh, like fulfill their goals i was really surprised they they law they resigned their uh, positions and they came and they worked uh, as a starting uh, post doctoral fellow i was surprised for dr nalamol and uh, he happened to be my classmate too so he was involved in this uh, experiment like uh, in this experiment we uh, euthanized the animals 3 days after stroke and we did uh, evans blue dye extravasation assay it is a simple assay like uh, after 3 3 days before you euthanize the animal you give a blue dye you inject a blue dye into the tail vein of the animal so when you inject the blue dye what happens uh, that blue dye goes into the circulation and it will be circulated throughout the body so every every organ every even eyes uh, limbs four limbs hind limbs everything becomes blue but because the blood brain barrier is so tight in the normal animals the blue color cannot be uh, like leaked into the brain so in sham animals you don't see this blue color despite uh, administration of this dye into the animal so this indicates see this shows how beautiful and how tight uh, this blood brain barrier is in normal human beings or normal animals but after stroke you can see i am giving stroke on the right side you can see right side there is bbb disruption and all the dye i gave into the uh, tail vein is leaked into the right brain indicating that there is a disruption of blood brain barrier on the right side so here you can see there is a lot of swelling you can see on the right side compared to this brain you can see lot of swelling inflammation edema and you can see blue color this indicates bbb disruption so here you can see in the ipsilateral side ipsilateral means ischemic side and contralateral i mean the left side so uh, left side is not affected right side is affected because i am giving stroke on the right side so you can see that blue color is reduced in tpsha given animals indicating that if you suppress tpa you are able to suppress bbb breakdown maybe if you suppress tpa it may be preventing the activation of mmps that is why you see no bbb breakdown but i want to prove that bbb breakdown by doing another experiment i, I am not satisfied with only that experiment for that reason i, I euthanized some animals at one day and i took the brains and i did the immuno blot analysis it is western blot analysis here you can see claudin 5 protein and zo1 proteins i talked about these are the tight junction proteins in normal animals there is lot of protein you can see but in uh, ischemia induced animals which are not treated or which are control shrna treated you don't see much uh, uh, much of these tight junction proteins indicating that after ischemia these tight junction proteins are degraded that is why you see leakage but when you suppress tpa you can again start seeing the protein which is significantly higher compared to the untreated animals that could be the reason there is no leakage in the bbb in animals that are treated with tpsh so it is not only i saw claudin for even uh, the same result i saw with zo1 it is another tight junction proteins so these results uh, confirm that uh, tps suppression is able to reduce bbb disruption okay so there is another experiment i i thought of doing like uh, i wanted to do like bbb breakdown after stroke leads to infiltration of leukocytes and the infiltrated monocytes are the primary source of mmp12 in the brain meaning that after stroke there is bbb breakdown and there is infiltration of monocytes 
and monocytes are the major source of mmp12 that means after stroke you should see more mmp12 in the brain but uh, i am saying that when you suppress tpa bbb breakdown is prevented so if bbb breakdown is prevented you should see less mmp12 right so i did another experiment uh, wherein i euthanized the animals on day 1 and i did real time pcr analysis to see mrna expression and immunoblot analysis to pre to see the protein expression of mmp12 here you can see mrna of mmp12 is significantly reduced when you suppress tpa in the protein also you can see significant reduction in uh, mmp12 when tpa is suppressed so this is the immunofluorescence analysis of mmp12 in the ipsilateral brain you can see this uh, fluorescence is significantly reduced in tpa such treated animals so all these experiments are concluding the same thing what is that when tpa is suppressed bbb disruption is reduced that is good if bbb disruption is reduced you can have less edema less inflammation and less brain damage right so preventing brain tp elevation decreases mmp12 expression in the brain so so that is fine we we got a wonderful uh, uh, data showing that when you suppress tpa there is redu reduction in brain damage but are we getting are we are the all these reductions in the brain damage are translated into functional recovery we want to see that because there is no drug so far uh, that can improve the recovery in stroke patients there is no drug which can improve the disability uh. or reduce the disability so here you see uh, dr kasimar fornal he is also joined along with the dr sivareddy challa with me in 2019 and uh, they both are working on this project so in this uh, experiment uh, i may not share all the results but i will show you some videos how we assess the disability after stroke and uh, how we see whether our treatments are able to reduce uh, disability and improve recovery so it is a simple experiment we train the animals for neurological tests before we give ischemia because unless they are trained they cannot perform so we make sure all the animals are performing in the tests before stroke we give ischemia and then reperfusion we give drug and we analyze the animals at different time points for different uh, sensory function and motor function tests so we do neurological assessment test so we assess the neurological score of the stroke induced animals this ranges from 1 to 18 if an animal get a score between 1 to 6 we call that means uh, it has mild injury and if it gets a 7 to 12 moderate injury and if an animal get a score more than 13 it has severe stroke injury so higher the score severe the damage <coughs> so as i mentioned earlier as i mentioned earlier when you ask a normal person to raise both the hands they can comfortably raise both the hands left and right the same way normal animals when you suspend the animal by holding its tail you can see its four limbs or like it, its hands right it it is able to extend both its four limbs but in case of stroke persons if you ask them to raise both the hands uh, they cannot raise especially if the stroke is affecting the uh, uh, function on the right side here so the same thing you can see in uh, animals like i am inducing stroke on the right side so the left uh, left side this animal is not able to extend its four limb see whatever we see in humans you can see in animals so this is the normal rat if you keep in a open field it uh, tries to explore the environment uh, it is comfortable it actually tries to explore and it can move left side right side it can comfortably walk it can walk straight but in case of stroke induced animals you can see you can see in the bottom uh, left corner this uh, video this animal the i am giving stroke on the right side right the left side became disabled it becomes uh, it got paralysis on the left side so the right side it is able to move right hand but left hand is not able to move left fore limb so that is why it is making circles so stroke induced animals make these circles so it is a typical uh, uh, symptom you can observe in stroke induced animals also stroke induced animals you can see seizures you can see see this uh, you can see the seizure e even in humans you can see uh, if the stroke is too much severe in humans you can see like uh, see like this uh, seizures 
So every uh, we we observe the animals for every every uh, function like motor function, sensory function, balance, and reflex function. And we give a score. So if you keep normal animal on a rectangular beam, it can comfortably stand on the beam by holding its both uh, uh, fore limbs and hind limbs on the beam. But a stroke induced animal, you can see the giving stroke on the right side, left side it is uh, uh, it is not able to place its left limb on the beam. And if you bring the whiskers of the animal towards the bench top, the animal immediately responds by placing its uh, uh, limb on the bench top. But in a case of stroke induced animals, if the whiskers are touching, even if you are touching the whiskers, uh, that means whiskers are uh, forming a, like a sensory motor function in uh, animals. So even if the whiskers are touched to the bench top, you, you see that this animal is not able to place the four limb on the bench, meaning that this sensor, there is a deficit in the sensory function. You can also see the videos. So this animal is able to place this limb, how comfortably it is placing, see. But this animal, even if you are touching the whiskers, it is not able to place that limb. And uh, so I will tell you what is the result at the end, but let me explain you what is what are all the tests we did. So here in this case, we have a, we stick a tape, sticky tape to the forelimb of the animal, affected forelimb and the unaffected forelimb. So normal animals, when you stick the tape, here you can see Dr. Chala is doing this experiment. So he is putting a sticky tape. If you if somebody put a sticky tape on your hand, what you will do? You you feel uncomfortable. You try to remove it, right? So the same thing the animal should do. See, it found that uh, there is some sticky tape uh, on its left hand and it is uh, trying to remove it by interacting with that all the time. So it is not comfortable, meaning that sensory and motor functions are good in this animal because this is a normal animal. But after inducing stroke, here you can see right bottom corner. So even though there is a sticky tape, it doesn't care. The animal doesn't care even there is a sticky tape because there is no function. There is no loss of sensory and motor functions in this animal. So. We, we assess this function over a period of time in animals with the different groups, untreated and treated, and we give a score to the animal. So interaction time, we calculate and we make a ratio towards the affected limb to the unaffected limb. And uh, we see that the TPSH animals show a very good recovery, significant improvement in the recovery. We also do beam walk test. We allow the animals to walk on the beam. We train the animals to walk on the beam before we do the you know, do induce them stroke. Initially, when you put the animal, it doesn't know. It, it, don't, it, it doesn't know like uh, I need to talk on the beam. But if you give training for two, three days, it will walk. Here, this animal, you see, this is a train rack. It can go to Olympics. See how fast it is crossing the beam. Very quick, right? So in stroke-induced animals, the problem, because the left side, uh, there is a disability, they cannot, they cannot even uh, stand on the beam. They fall from the beam, but over a period of time, there can be natural recovery. They will be able to stay on the beam, but they won't perform like a treated animal or a, a normal animal. Even in humans, uh, after a couple of uh, months after stroke, you can see some uh, improvement in the function that is natural recovery. So even without treatment, you can see that natural recovery even in the rats. So we also do rotor rod test. There is a rotating rod. Uh, so we to assess the motor coordination and motor function. We do this uh, experiment. So we put a stroke induced animals on this rod, which is rotating. And we see how much time these animals are able to stay on this beam, the latency to stay. And stroke induced animals will fall down uh, soon. But uh, treated animals, if the recovery is improved, Motor function is improved, they stay for a longer time. So we also have this rotor rod in our uh, uh, Andhra University Pharmacology Department. We did uh, experiments uh, on the rotor rod when we are in the MPharm and uh, PhD, we showed to MPharm students. So we are doing the same kind of tests like here also to assess the motor function. So what we do in our university, don't think that uh, we are not doing uh, uh, good research. So we are doing the same what I learned 15, 20 years ago to assess the sensory and motor function. So our TPSH treatment improved the recovery. 
and uh, disability. So I want to summarize here. I want to conclude. I am. I, I hope uh, I am used the uh, given time. So after ischemic stroke, there is increase in brain TPA, which is leading to BBB disruption, inflammation, infarct volume, and uh, sensory motor deficits, disability, and uh, decreased recovery. But when you suppress TPA by SHRNA treatment, you can prevent the tight junction protein degradation. You can reduce monocyte infiltration. You can decrease MMP12 expression in the brain, and you can decrease inflammatory cytokines. So overall, all these effects can lead to improvement in the neurological outcome. So finally, based on all our results, we conclude that targeting TPA may be a promising therapy for ischemic stroke. And uh, I thank all my postdocs, uh, Bharat Chelipoyna, I talked about them. Uh, he worked for six years. He's a pharmacognosy student from Arandra University. Dr. Nalamolu, he did pharmaceutics, and uh, he's a pharmacology student in master's. Siva Reddy Challa, he did pharmacology, PhD, under uh, Anapurna Madam. And we have Dr. Casimir Fornal, he's uh, from USA. So uh, several uh, uh, MD students, undergrad students, MBT students worked in my lab, and we have uh, several co-investigators working in other departments and other universities participate in this research. And I thank all of them for their hard work. My, mine is only ideas and I do some surgeries. I help them uh, analyze the data, but uh, all the work was done by the postdocs. And uh, you all know that it is the financial assistance that drive any research program. Although we have a lot of excitement, we can't do anything if there is no financial assistance. And I'm fortunate to have financial assistance from several local funding agencies uh, and uh, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke of the NIH. So in 2018, I got $2 million grant funding from NIH, which is approximately 15 uh, crores of Indian rupees. Uh, and after I got this grant, I was able to recruit Dr. Sivaredi Challa into the lab, and he did a lot of uh, good research. And I want to publish all these results. We are uh, putting a manuscript together to send it to Nature Communications, uh, and I will see where it lands. Let us see. And finally, uh, I thank uh, my mentor, uh, Professor Annapurna Garu. Uh, uh, Madam, I am really lucky uh, and I am blessed uh, to work under her uh, guidance. It is in addition to research, I learned the moral values and ethics by watching her. Uh, uh, it, it is a great privilege for me and it's a great honor for me. And before I come to this presentation, I didn't know that she is coming, she is talking. I was really surprised and uh, with uh, double the energy, uh, I could uh, complete my presentation. Thank you. And uh, I thank you, everyone who paid attention uh, to this talk. And I thank Dr. Ishwar Kumar uh, for being in touch with me and communicating everything to me uh, in time and organizing this event. I also thank Dr. Rajendra Prashad Garu for all his support. He also came to USA and uh, he was with me. He came to my lab. Uh, I, I was very happy. So thank you all uh, for your attention. Maybe mute case. See a video. Hello. Uh, Kumar, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Doctor so, Krishna Kumar. Ah, sir. Doctor Krishna Kumar. Sir, sir. I can hear you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. We really appreciate your efforts you have put in. Thank you so much for joining us today. This late evening, you are uh, able to talk to us. Sir, thank you. Thank Honor you. for me. Yeah, yeah. Professor Sachin Garu is also there. Uh, he is interacting with you. Sir, he, uh, the, uh, we showed all the animal experiments we did here. We showed all the lab cell culture work to Dr. Yeah. Uh, Professor Assassin Garu. He was very happy. He was very excited. Uh, uh, I yeah, can yeah, see yeah. in his uh, uh, eyes uh, at that time, he was really yeah, happy yeah. to see the lab. And uh, he also delivered a talk here. And uh, it was it was a wonderful time we spent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also visited you. I really appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, Dr. Krishna Kumar, my request is uh, uh, you explore the possibility of any MOU with Andhra University, uh, at least uh, in the exchange of students, or uh, carrying out research work, giant research work uh, in such, a, such areas. Uh, 
you please yes, sir i will uh, i will talk more about it later with you to oh, understand yeah, yeah. Uh, what what yeah, yeah. is that and how it works yeah yeah and uh, when you visit to uh, india please uh, uh, make a trip to visakhapatnam without fail yeah sure sir okay please thank you very much yes much. hello 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 Uh, that's a wonderful presentation by Krishna Kumar, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Now I uh, like to know if any questions are there from the audience. So in the absence of any, Hello. Hello. Uh, sir. Yeah. This is uh, Professor Kumar, Kishan from. Can you, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, yes, Kumar, I can, can you hear me. Yeah, I'm hearing. I'm from the assistant speaking. Yes, sir. Good morning. Okay. Sir, uh, uh, yes. I mentioned I visited your lab and you have demonstrated the experiment. And I gave a le lecture at your lab. Some, some years ago. Hello, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. Hey, okay. Can you help me? I can hear you. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, you mentioned that the TPA tissue plasminogen activator yes. is playing a key role. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have any substances to prevent it? Uh, we don't have uh, any natural products that can yes. prevent uh, the synthesis. Okay. So, if you want to prevent the synthesis, you have to go with uh, SHRNA therapy. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are we are planning to develop uh, in collaboration with the scientists at other universities. We are planning to develop uh, single chain variable fragment small molecule antibodies. Okay. Uh, so before we take it to the humans, because we can't take SHRNA therapies to humans until mm -hmm. we study the mechanisms in the animals. These mm -hmm. SHRNAs are fine, but developing them for humans is very difficult. So we want to develop uh, small molecule antibodies. Okay, yeah, one of my relatives recently, he had brain stroke. The symptoms were, oh, sir? Yeah, recently he had a brain stroke. And Who? One of my relatives, one of my relatives. Okay, okay. Uh, he, he was suffering with continuous headache. Okay. So then the, uh, the doctors advised uh, uh, spiral, spiral, I mean, one, one spring, one spring was introduced through the vein. One spring was introduced through, through, through a vein. And that, uh, that helped him ultimately. Yeah, yeah. So in my presentation, I talked about TPA treatment that breaks the clot into pieces. Mm -hmm. But uh, if the pay, if you have a patient in the hospital who comes after 4.5 hours of symptoms, so they introduce the spring and uh, they cause mechanical thrombectomy. Mechanically, they break the clot, mm. and that is also allowed only until 24 hours. Mm. After 24 hours, even you can't do that. Mm. So it is good that at least he was uh, he was uh, introduced that the spring and uh, artery was opened. That is good. Yeah, he, he is uh, after the introduction of the spring. To the vein, he was all right. He was all right. Very good, sir. Mm. Then uh, he was prescribed steroids, anti-hypertensive drugs, and then uh, what do we call the brain stimulants. Uh, we need a lot of medications to reduce the uh, symptoms or problems associated with the stroke because uh, this. Uh, the, that spring can only open the blood vessel, but it mm. cannot address the damage that is already occurred. Right, right. Yeah. So he was, he was given, he was given antihypertensive drugs, he was given uh, okay. brain stimulants, he was also given steroids. Okay. Yeah. Steroids, uh, maybe, maybe to control the inflammation. Mm. Yes, there are the uh, information. Brain yeah. stimulants. Yeah. 
brain stimulants can improve the function perhaps yeah the the pathology that occurs after a stroke uh, mm. and after reperfusion in the brain is very mm. complex you you name it sir ne- there is a necrosis there is free radical damage there is apoptosis there is a inflammation there is edema so mm. you name it there are a lot of damage and there are each pathway includes so many molecular mechanisms so many molecules are involved so mm. single drug cannot address the whole problem you have to go for uh, uh, treatments multiple treatments that address multiple pathways okay yeah your 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 research is in a, in a good condition i mean in a good approach is a good approach i think you can find out a alternative therapy you can you yes, find sir. out an alternative therapy yes sir so, i will i will focus on that right now we are also focusing on stem cells we mm-hmm. did lot of work on stem cells we published on stem cells we are uh, we want to expand this to even uh, <coughs> alternate medicine and uh, herbal uh, herbal medicine eventually uh, but actually everything depends on funding here uh, mm. and i also want to tell everyone uh, who who are attending this uh, talk mm. if you if you have uh, some uh, animal surgery experience and if you have really passion passion for research uh, you can contact me whenever uh, positions are available uh okay. i can uh, i can uh, communicate to you because uh, we, i need passion it is uh, i have so many people worked with me who worked mm-hmm. almost 10 to 15 years after phd and they settled and they dropped everything and they come here they worked like a fresh post docs and uh, i was really lucky to have such kind of uh, people uh, coming into my lab okay, i am really good. thankful to them okay good Continue your work. It is a good line of work. Sure, sir. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Krishna Kumar. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you on the panel today. And I still remember that you gave a lecture uh, when you visited Andhra in Delhi. Mm-hmm. And I think I did three, three or four years back. Yeah. And uh, yeah. whatever, <laughs> what I can see that whatever you said during our interaction are happening right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually. Huh. actually dr annapurna madam and you and me uh, we planned for a combination project to uh, indian yes. government right it is yes, a foreign yes. exchange something grant we planned and two yes. days before madam accident also we talked about that grant uh, application yes. we are about to submit it and uh, we end up with the, like this and uh, it was unfortunate yes. but anyway i am happy madam recovered a lot she is able to listen to us she can respond to us i am really happy yeah, that's really great Okay, Krishna Kumar. The, the, we'll move on to the next speaker now. Okay. Our next speaker is. Kumar. Thank you, <laughs> Krishna Kumar. This is Dr. Ishwar Kumar. Ah, Ishwar, Ishwar, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Yeah. 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 Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you once again for accepting our new invitation. Yeah. Thank you. It was an honor for me. It's a privilege. Ah, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right. Okay, Krishna. Right. Uh, the next speaker. Speak uh, okay, sir. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Krishna M. Boyni. Uh, he will give a plenary talk, and I request my colleague, Dr. Shailiza, to introduce him. Now. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Of course, uh, this is the evening to all the speakers. This is Dr. Shailendra, Assistant Professor from Pharmaceutical Technology Department. Loud. Mm, loud. Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, the bioderta of uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Krishna M. Boini. Um, Dr. Boini, uh, he he earned a, earned a Bachelor of Pharmacy degree and a Master of Pharmacy degree with a Pharmacology specialization uh, from Andhra University, Vishakhapatnam. After earning a PhD in pharmacology from uh, University of uh, Tübingen, Germany, he completed postdoctoral training at the University of Tübingen, German, Germany, and uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, USA. Later, he was joined as an assistant professor of pharmacology at University of Houston, College of Pharmacy, Houston, Texas, in 2016. Dr. Boini has been honored uh, with the renal 
with the renal uh, college of pharmacy hosted in texas in 2016 and dr boyni has been honored with the renal research recognition award uh, and the amazon postal uh, excellence in renal research award from american oh, okay, okay. okay 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 yes uh, Sudhir Gupta, young scientist and American radio uh, labeled junior scientist awards from Association of Scientists of Indian Origin in America. Then uh, he also achieved teaching and research excellence awards from University of Houston. Dr. Boyne has published more than 114 articles in high impact scientific journals and presented 122 abstracts in national and international meetings. Dr. Boyni serves as a reviewer and editorial member uh, of several international journals. His research interests mainly focus on the renal physiology and pathophysiology in mouse models in renal diseases, hypertension, and obesity. Dr. Boyni's current project uh, is on instigation of glomerular injury by inflammasomes in obesity beyond inflammation. is being supported by a five-year uh, project and is uh, supporting with uh, 1.7 million grant dollars, uh, 7 million dollars of grant from national and national institutes of health. I'm happy to share your uh, bio data, sir. And uh, his title is on talk uh, to the young students uh, who are interested uh, to go abroad. Uh, that is on uh, PhD and MS admissions in US universities and a career in academia and industry. Now I request uh, Mr. Boini uh, to go through the topic. Thank you. Open the text. Okay. okay. Just wait a minute. Can you see my presentation? I'm not looking at. Where is it? Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Ah, uh, give me a minute sir, because I'm unable to see myself. Oh. Ah, yeah. uh, where is it? Because this is the first time I'm using the WebEx. Oh. Okay, not layout. I can see your screen. Just a minute, sir. I'm going to share. Is the Chagga Vinan the PhD MS program in US? One of my friends, he will give a talk. Chagga hmm? Vinter, or you listen, or else I want to go to home. Train which team? So, where is it? Yes, sir, madam, please mute your uh, audio. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. One minute only. Just uh, give me a second, please. Uh, where is it? Okay. I can see Dr. Vijay Sri's video. Uh, my, where is the screen? That's what I'm looking now. Ah, sorry, sir, sir. Can you see, sir, now? Hello? Hello? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. Today I will discuss about the PhD and MS admissions in US universities and career in academia and industry. So before I start my presentation, I wanted to say thank you very much for Dr. Professor Y. Rajendra Prasad Garu, is a principal college of AU College of Pharmacy, and, and yeah, AU College of Pharmacy, and also Dr. Ishwar Kumar for giving, and uh, associate professor and okay. associate for giving me this opportunity to present my uh, today's presentation. And on, this, uh, on this special day, for my mentor, Dr. Anapurna was a 
my master's thesis mentor. So it's very honored to me present something here. On, uh, it's not my research topic, but I wanted to help some students to uh, get the admissions into USA. And uh, I worked with Dr. Miss, uh, Dr. Professor Annapurna on the evaluation of hypoglycemic and anti hypoglycemic effects of Dathura metal seeds in normal and alloxan in these rabbits. That time when we started doing research, there's a lot of problems. It was 20 years ago, but now everything has changed a lot. But uh, I'm fortunate to publish in the International Journal that time. I really want to thank you to my mentor, Dr. Professor Annapurna. And today I'll give a talk is the uh, PhD. Why PhD degree you want to do in outside India? I do my, actually I'm working on the obesity in this chronic kidney diseases, how this obesity causes the kidney diseases and looking for the mechanisms and mainly working because uh, you know if you take any anti-inflammatory drugs for example right if you take anti-inflammatory paracetamol ibuprofen or boviron or diclofenac sodium those drugs cannot decrease as your cardiovascular disease or kidney diseases right so because uh, those are no anti-inflammatory drugs they may not affect you because these are the before this uh, in development of the inflammation, the inflammasomes are activated. Those inflammasomes can cause the inflammation is the one part. It's a one up to, up to, up to the four part. We target with the one part is the only one part, so it will not protect you. So that's what we are working in the lab. As a, we got, I got as a 1.7 million, nearly 12, 12 crore rupees. It was five years ago we got it. And I was fortunate to recruit some students from Andhra University as well as from Kakati University and from Chandigarh University. It was my, I'm very happy to recruit from India. Now also I'm going to talk about the young generation. Why you want to do PhD outside India? Because everybody wanted to go to the same university and same place and are in the in India. So I wanted to show you some opportunities to you. So you need to gain some professional knowledge or develop your career. Okay. And it's the best place for your subject because we already learned a lot of things in the during undergraduate and in master's degree. So you should learn something else in the you should learn something else outside. And also you need to develop the comparative research interest with other faculty. You can learn the new things. A lot of new innovation is going on. So we should learn that those things. You should learn, develop that. And also you should learn about the culture, different culture in the different countries and lifestyle and education system. And Perhaps, and these are the important to consider the PhD outside of India. And this is also part of the education, right? We should do outside also. And perhaps also the funding situation for the studying the PhD is a complicated in India compared to the outside the India. I will show you some slides in, in the USA and Germany of how is the situation of the PhD degrees, okay? So it's, it's better, to, these are the several reasons to consider the PhD degree outside India. And, uh, and this, so for the getting the PhD or master's degree in the United States, we need the, as everybody knows it, but I'm going to show them, we need the GRE score. The GRE score, for example, right now is a 340. We need at least 280 or 290 until the last year. But we last year, we also removed the GRE. It's not, we are not accepting GRE anymore. And TOEFL, we expect them at least 75 or 80, 70, 90, 79. We expect them out of 100 and because the TOEFL is or we can also consider to take the IELTS because this TOEFL is important so that when you come and to join in the laboratory in the research you, you should know some in English right you need to understand the English language so that's why they in the United States they expect some TOEFL or IELTS you should pass that exam and statement of purpose is a two-page document they will expect you and grade sub transcript your your academic degrees like your certificates and all the transcript they will expect you and three to four recommendation letters and also you need to pay application fees these are the requirements you need to in in the hand when you apply for the master's or phd degree and i, I cannot ask the, and as we know that from India, if you do study the master's, most of the students is trying to apply for the master's degree in the US. For the uh, for the, the B.Tech students, applying the master's degree is good. But as for pharmacy students, I'm not going to recommend you. I will show you why I'm not going to recommend you. You will see here. Uh, I will discuss the differences between the master's degree as well as the pharmacy degree in the US. So if you study, come for, if you apply for the, all the criteria is the same for the master's degree as well as PhD degree. So for the master's degree, it's a two years degree and the thesis is only for six months. Like in India is the same. 
and they will not cover the your incidents you have to cover the incidents for yourself and there is a no stipend and no tuition fees so they will not pay you not even a single penny single rupee or they will not pay your tuition fees you need to cover everything and if which cost approximately 30000 dollars or 25 lakhs for 2 years okay and if 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 you are in a pharmacy studied a bachelor of pharmacy or pharmacy and if you come with that a master's degree in india if you come with that again master's degree i am not going to recommend you i will show you why and if you come for the phd degree if it is a only 5 years degree you can and it's a thesis is for 3 years after because of 2 years is a academic course work like that you learn the again the advanced pharmacology one advanced pharmacology two and a little bit of molecular pharmacology cellular pharmacology just like like that we learn the some two years of the course and then three years of the research total is five years degree and we will pay you the full health insurance coverage here and also we will cover the full funding for the phd program including your tuition fees gtf means is a graduate tuition fees we will pay, pay all the tuition fees whatever it is it's a 30000 100000 50000 it doesn't matter we they will pay you and also they will cover the health insurance and you know sure that they will pay the funding for you it's a 25000 dollars for year it's approximately 2 lakh 2000 rupees for year that means for month it's a 1 lakh 40000 rupees they will pay you for your pocket and from that your expenses could be around from 1 lakh 40000 your expenses could be around 30000 or 40000 around approximately it's like 500 500 dollars like because you share the accommodation with someone else so it should be that you can save 1 lakh rupees so about comparing all the and and a master degree is not required to apply for the for doctoral degree okay if you are a bachelor's degree or if you are pharmd students you should consider applying the master's degree i would recommend you to apply for the phd degree so there is not we don't need a master's degree also okay but i will explain you in the next few slides what you need what what kind of because when i was in the india i have a lot of problems with my phd program i started with my finished with my master's thesis with dr anapurna and immediately uh, after that i got a company job but dr professor anap professor s satnarayana master is there is my mentor is my guru i cannot i have so many things to uh, uh talk about him but i'm not going to talk too much so he helped me to he said just continue the phd and the next day of my masters i just started my phd degree without the notification in andhra university i started my research and without i just finished it and just spent for two days or three days and then started my research and i did the research for one year or one year and two months and that time we got a new vice chancellor in university it was 2002 2004 i'm not going to talk here the names and all that vice chancellor made a rule that only one student is allowed for the under one faculty so at that time we are already two or three are waiting to get into the enrollment so i am unable to get the admission for next two years i had to wait it so that is the time i quit that program from the andhra university and then moved to germany so i am really thankful to my professor s satnarayan garu for giving me this entering my enter, taking into the phd program so i will show you the next generation how to get into the phd program in the us so why doctoral degree is so important you need to get some research training you need to learn some new things and you want to pursue the scholarly subject in great depth because in the bachelor of pharmacy or master of pharmacy you will learn little bit whether the this drug can produce the anti inflammatory effect diabetic effect or little bit we know that what i did the same thing but here we will look for the in depth in the wow these causes what are the uh, pathways are involved what are the molecules we will dig into the inside and you need to make a fundamental contribution to the field and because you want to teach and also if you want to teach the at the college level now as everybody knows that a phd is required to be a professor at most of the universities or in the industry also if you want to be survive right now we are expecting as to do the phd right and and reasons not to go to the graduate school if you enjoy taking classes if you think that it's a fun okay if they are paying my staff and i want to go to the college a phd program that's i'm not going to recommend you it's not a fun at all it's not a, if you are just for the fun you want to enjoy your classes no don't come to the phd program please and you are in a hurry to get a quick job as a phd if you do a phd it's hard to get a job immediately 
and don't expect the so increase your sal salary the phd as a phd students or phd once we start our salary started slowly but it will go like anything after a couple of years once you establish in the field uh, for example i would say here as a faculty i see them that they are getting like 300000 or 300 350000 they can reach but if they are in the Federal, federal government job, some industry job, they might end up with $200,000 for a year, something. But as a faculty, if you are the going, growing age, our growth will be later stages, but not in the beginning. You don't come to look at the money in the you want to do, but don't enter the PhD program. And who will pay your PhD program? How you will get the, your stipend? So good. most of the poor, poor graduate doctoral programs are usually free of cost for everyone. It's because either you will work as a research assistantship as Dr. Kubira Valley said, that we also have the NIH grants, right? The NIH is a federal agency in the United States. They will give you the, some millions of dollars for the faculty to do the research. We, we will submit a project, they will give the money. So with that money, we will recruit some graduate students. They can, we will pay them as a research assistantship. And it, or you can also work for a teaching assistantship. Teaching assistantship means you while you are studying the graduate program every week we expect you to do 20 hours for the taking the attendance for the formed students. It's not we'll say 20 hours, but it's never be 20 hours. It should be five hours, sometimes six hours because and last two years it's online. We will check online whether their students is not there or not because as a formed students we expect them that 100 percent attendance for each class. So. These TAs will go there and check the attendance. It takes only two, three minutes because we give the each num number for the student. They will sit in the same desk, same place for every day. So we'll just, we'll, it takes five minutes actually. But we'll pay, as we'll expect them two hours, 20 hours per week. Sorry, 20 hours per month. Yeah. Sorry, 20 hours per month. Not a, and it's a fellowship. We Or you can also get a fellowship from the India and the our DST is giving some fellowships. With that, you can come there for the study your family program. And right now, a lot of people coming from Pakistan with the fellowship, they can get their own fellowship from the government. We'll just offer that admission at any time for them. And this is the best reason not to go to the master's because if you go to the master's degree and there is a and you come here and you will spend that up that much money, and then you can if you want to go to the PhD program, again, you have to compete with the same applicants, either those applicants from the PharmD, bachelor's degree or PharmD or master's degree from India. Here, it doesn't matter whether you studied a master's degree within the US or outside the US. Of course, if you study in the master's in the US, you have some advantage that if you make a connection with the professor, if you talk to him, some meetings or somewhere, if you have some connection with the, some friends, then it's a helpful. Otherwise, it's not no helpful. So that's a reason that this graduate program is completely paid by either of the TA position or RA position or fellowship. And where to apply? So when factors to consider, when you apply for the application for the PhD program, you should consider the ranking of the program versus the strength of your application. Because your application strength is not that much strong. If you apply for the Hi-Fi University, you're not going to get the admission there. You should think seriously that when you're applying, whether my my credential are not enough to get into the program, whether uh, they have the specific openings that year available or not. If you apply them, like for most of the times what happens is I see them personally as we come from India, our seniors apply, go to the university and we go there, we apply that. And when we write the TOEFL GRE, we just put that names and you apply there, but, but they have no openings from the faculty, how they will recruit you in that year, particular year. So, I would seriously recommend you uh, to uh, look at the uh, how many vacancies are available during that particular year when you are applying it, and you look how many si how much how many applicants how many applicants they are going to recruit that particular year. You should look at it, and also I would rec strongly recommend you to consider location because some of the locations in the US is not so safe. Uh, some of them are very cold because you might don't like the cold places, so you should look because for example I could say I'm in the Texas. And Dr. Viravelli just gave a presentation, right? He's in the Chicago. Chicago is a much colder place than the Houston. Houston is a place like a, Texas is a, like Indian temperature all the times. And so it's a different between here and there. So some people have this, some sickness comes in the cold winter. So they should also consider that is the one factor through that. And ad identifying an advisor, eventually uh, 
uh, identifying the mentoring is important. If this relationship with your thesis advisor will be like the most impact aspect of the graduate school. If you're a good advisor, it's easy to get into a PhD and finish your PhD without any problem. He will take care of everything as a kid from the family. And it's a, while it's a difficult to assess from far, yeah, okay. So if you wanted to know how, where to identify the, identify the advisors, first I would suggest you strongly, I suggest you to talk to your faculty in India. If you're studying in India, talk to your mentor, talk to your faculty, and uh, they will suggest you, uh, or they will also so maybe attend, if you have possibility, attend as if you're in the master's degrees, attend the conferences, or if, if anybody coming from India and giving the talk, you can make them contact. And if they meet, you give a seminar, talk after the seminar, you can go and talk to them for two minutes. Once you talk to them, once after a few days, send them email that I met you. I was so impressed with the talk, something like that. Some, start the networking. And you can also look for the sources of information is from the US news ranking of graduate schools. And also you can look the information in the Google. Okay? These are the things. How to choose? So you should get a list of the universities which offer your subject. Because if you are interested, if you are studying the bachelor's and master's degree, if you are studying the pharmacology, if you want to apply, if there is, if you apply for the pharmacognosy or pharmacology, if they don't, they don't have the upper openings, no use. Don't look at them. So look at the issue universities, which because not, for example, in my university, we don't have any pharmacognosy or or the pharmaceutical analysis division. We have the pharmacology and pharmaceutics and the pharmaceutical medicinal chemistry. So you should list the universities which offer your area of subject and interest and talk to your tutors and pinpoint the leaders in the field talk to your mentors and and also contact the universities for information before you apply i would highly recommend you to contact some universities because as a faculty i see them last couple of years we we will identify how many openings coming up for the next fall for example for me next fall is a next August, right? But we came up idea sometime in uh, this year in October, we have an idea that, okay, we are going to recruit this many students, but this year I know we were and when. So it's better to contact the university, they will provide, they have the graduate advisor, she will inf give information to you. And look at your ad ad admission standard, what they are expecting, whether you have enough credential to apply for that. And is the cost of attending, if I get the stipend, whether I can survive, with the stipend or not, because it depends on the city also. And financial aid possibilities, they will provide the possibilities that university. If you apply for the private university, they are not going to pay you. Remember that. When you look at the, important to look at the financial aid when you're applying. Because as we came from India, we see each application costs $50, $50. You cannot apply for 20, 30 applications. It's too much for you, definitely. So. I apply for five to 10, that's a max, but we identify them, select them, that's a very important. So, and also if you contact with the seniors and we will definitely help you to identify and we will we know where the vacancies could be available and all. To contact your, it's easy to talk to your faculty in other university or other universities, because I know some people university gen from Kakati University today. So it's talk to them wherever you are. The, their faculty should have the their friends should be in the US and they are maybe working in the field or working in the industry. They might know some where, where the places are good and all. Okay. So this is the criteria I so I just now I spoke about, right? We need a GRD score, TOEFL score, and statement of purpose, transcript. And I'm going to talk in detail about this. And a graduate's lifestyle in the US. It's a graduate's lifestyle provide a very attractive lifestyle. So Unlike classes, you can also approach research at your own pace. For example, we don't have the classes from nine to five. As a first, I said that in the PhD program in the US, first two years, if you come for the bachelor's or master's degree from India, it doesn't matter. But first two years, we expect you to do that they should take the two courses in the two. Some universities are taking for three years, but my university, we made them that two years, they need to finish all the coursework. And next two years, they need to finish the research. We expect them to four years, they should be done not too much time and because uh, unlike, so we don't have classes from nine to five, we have classes from uh, nine to 12, I think two days a week uh, for one subject. It's a three credit hours course. So, so we have the two subjects we'll take maximum for semester. So it's a six hours. Yeah, it's a six hours, six hours. So 12 hours course for one week. 
period so and if you finish because during the day you have only 3 hours of class you can do the research after the time if you finish the early course in the by 12 you can do research by 2 hours and usually uh, the work hours are flexible if you get some people do start from 4 o'clock to 8 o'clock it's up to them we don't ask them when they need to do or some people uh, during the weekdays they will prepare and weekend they will come and take care of some cells and do research and also if you are pharmd students or pf is a pharmacy pharmacy health outcomes and practice students they will work from home because they don't have any bench work so it's also flexible they can do a phd from the home also and your vacation days are like extremely it's not so difficult because we are outside the country we want to go to india we talk to the mentor and mentors will always give them for one month or one and a half month if you are happy they are happy and, the, and then with the all this or is vacation is flexible because we have the break from the may to august every year in the summer time uh, during the summer time we can go there or if the december 15th to january 15th one month time most of the graduate students they will go back to india and if mentors are okay and your department has no issues to send them to india because if we put in too much pressure they cannot concentrate on anything so it's a flexible and you can also work on the projects directly not related to your degree because while you are doing the research also you can involve with other project okay and there is extremely supportive community of peers and mentors you can your fellow you can work with your fellow students and share your background and interest with them and also your good thesis advisor also serves as an all round life coach once you found the good thesis advisor this thesis advisor can be forever because wherever you go wherever you apply for the positions faculty position they ask for the recommendation letters or we can talk to them okay sir i'm getting the opportunity here what is your suggestion should i go there or not we if you maintain the good relationship with your mentors this is very important still uh, i am sometimes i have contact with my mentors as a phd mentor or my masters mentors ma uh, some in the university some mentor dr satnayana or sometimes so with the, uh, my post doctoral mentor still now i talk to them sometimes i'll meet them and talk advise i'll take the friends also dr viravelli we talk them call them and talk and some gatta sometimes we'll talk them we always talk guys this is a advisor is always important for us and there is a, no competition always remember that if you talk to something that's they will not take anything from you they will give advice to you it's better to open up talk to them and there is a built in support for international students we have the international organization they will try to pick you from the airport and they will take care of everything and also uh, if you generate the data and publish the papers we have the opportunity to go to the travel the meeting attend the excellent meeting in the six conferences you can present your data in this conference we it's not for fun to go to conference fun is conference that's a time we wait for every year, one three days to go to the meeting to make the network talk to the people attend the meetings so if you publish that you have the opportunity to meet them and so i will talk about some letter of recommendations how to with letter of recommendations and statement of purpose so little bit about them uh, so letter of preference these are very important we will mainly when we get application we will look at go to the mentors and recommendation letters and see them who wrote the recommendation letter for them for example it's i can tell you about those it's very important to start developing a relationship with the letter writers as soon as possible possible years in advance because as we know that getting a recommendation letter is easy we thinks but it's not true as if, if you go and talk to your faculty in in your college like a bachelor of pharmacy they teach you some subjects and all that might not be helpful sometimes because they will talk about okay this student did a good job in the my course work and he got a good score and all but that may not be helpful to get into the admission phd we will look for any research experience during that time so i would highly recommend you to involve some research assistantship i say there is no research assistant means nothing nothing it's after your class talk to the faculty spend one hour or two hours for a day or for week few hours at least try to spend two hours with the in the project involve them uh, and also you can so they will give some recommendation letter about your research and also ask the questions in the class and pursue the project outside of your class so if you ask the questions okay this faculty remember that okay this guy is interested in the subject he is asking me questions he will remember you if you are 100 members if you sit there in the classroom and go out and ask the recommendation he neither faculty as i know we can just give the casual letter that's not enough to get into the admission you should think that you should be a little bit smart to play a role 
and take a leadership in academy and extra curricular if you are doing anything extra curricular activities like today if you are doing the conducting this uh, and meetings right you should involve in that take the opportunity go and talk to them should i do anything for you take the leadership role and do involvement and so our extra curricular activities there are need being in the conduct so the faculty okay these guys so and so he is doing let leave it no if for example i can say whoever in the us says us they even the still the faculty is remember them because they might they might be did something better than uh, previous times when during their ten, tenure during the time in the previous so you should remember do something else something and when you request the letter you should provide the letter writer and you can complete you can also provide the application i'm applying so and so and you can give them some background information this university is expecting this much so if they expect this kind of points so talk to them they will give a good recommendation letter if you don't have the mentor right now if you don't have any faculty in your mind just think about right now who can advise you to write a good recommendation letter or who can guide you for the next few your career just talk to them observe them and think and then just start a relation slowly gradually start from the second year and can the art suggest you from if you are bachelor of pharmacy second year end up second year to be beginning of third year think about it okay and or if you are a masters you are good shape because you have the already you know the moves or advisor talk to him and do extra work not the routine work to get your masters degree do little bit extra involve with the patch research scholars work they in the beginning they've said no we don't want anything and but you can go and show them you try to do little bit different okay and and a statement of purpose when you write the recommendation letter this statement of purpose normally we look at them why this guy want to do research in the particular subject and pharmacology or medicinal chemistry or pharmacognosy or pharmaceutics why this area is he was so interested we should tell them that okay i am interested in the research area in the so and so my far grandfather was some disease if for example uh, dr professor satnan was talk about some brain to his relatives right something you can you can make a story that okay my my for example you are applying for the dr viravelli lab you can say that okay my uh, my relatives got a brain stroke and all so i am interested to know about how this works and finding the new drugs and so on so cut and they just think you can write whatever you want to do just but think about that and you can highlight your prior research okay and you can understand a viable question think about some disease conditions or some drugs and our area of research if you are applying to the particular university if you have something in your mind think about that their research and then do that that's a way to help you uh, and other one you can also it's worthwhile to read the conference and general papers to understand the terminology because when you applying to the my college you can go and look at my papers and look at talk about a little bit about that and i'm interested so and so is research and this is useful my parents are something they are obese and how their kidneys are functioning and also means you can make a stories these things we can forget it when you come back they will not going to look once you get admission but this is the important statements you need to put into the statement of purpose okay you should make a nice story and ask your professor for feedback they will try and revise several times before you send them this is a two page statement okay so and uh, how to uh, target accepted targeting the specific schools many applicants okay for example the many applicants write a recommendation letter because you are going to apply for the recommend because i give a talk in the future you might be ask me can i give me a recommendation letter on applying for university same university that not going to help you don't ask me recommendation letter anything to me even though i know you that will harm your application because we are in the committee or might be i might be I, last 5 or 6 years i am in the committee recruiting we are two three three faculty we are recruiting and interviewing or screening all applications but don't ask me recommendation letter anything but instead of asking me recommendation letter from the same college you can do like like go to the papers from the college you are keeping in mind that you i'm going to apply for this faculty two or three faculty so do the research read those papers two three papers and if you can point out some questions because you can point some questions and say that uh, this research is interesting something like that and then you can share your ideas about this research you can do little bit further and all and few days if he reply to you, you that's good you like my paper and all then next say that okay sir i'm going to apply for the phd in your program can you help me something and they will guide you my because that's uh, most of the times 
and when we are in the graduate program we don't have the opportunity to look all the papers in the journal it's very tough to look at them we have to go to library and open the book and it's a old story we have to read the book and go open it all that's a very that's got's gone now the world in your mobile just go to the mobile and open and see them and do the research and make them okay so that's the best way if you are interested with some faculty i know because if you ask me the faculty if when i am in the like, thinking for the graduate students i may get contact because for example i can say my story one story i i was interviewed i was something in my mind when i wanted to interview i interviewed one candidate and i am about to recruit him and uh, in my mind that he is my known friend friend something like relative and i am in my mind that i am going to recruit but in the interview what we ask one question and uh, how, how do you want to publish your papers and if you get, do some research if you don't publish before you go he said he will take the data with him it's not his mentor's lab it's his own lab research that's not true whatever you do in the lab that's a mentor right like so you should provide the you should think that okay, it's make a sure okay you should, that's okay it's a, something different so i did not take him but what at the same time somebody sent me application that time i just didn't care he care that application but once I, we take this mind take out this application is about to get it but with when i go to my emails and talk to the see that email and i contact them you are still interested to come so we will take them so try to send them emails definitely will think them if you send uh, even the dr viravel is said if you are interested just send them email and then we will keep in the mind if you have passion So if you send me several times, over okay, six months or one year or something, they show up interest. Then we think, okay, this guy is really definitely will definitely help you at some times. Maybe not the right away. Maybe in one month, two months. But we'll definitely don't think that we will not check your email. We will check your email. We will sometimes we may respond, but may not be respond. But it's in our brain. We'll never never miss anything. Okay, just try to start a com- communication with your mentors and. recently from last two years the graduate programs what happened is the gre they take out a gre because we as a faculty we observed that some play some students they are coming from different countries their speaking and other the english language is not good as we expected because of the inter- interviews we know that but they are getting the scores like anything i know how we are getting it right now also if you pay some money you are getting it done but that's not a way so that's why we are trying to take out the gre last two years we take out a gre because uh, the schools uh, the, the we are expected gre but in india or other places in the, because of the covid pandemic they are not able to take the gre exam we remove that and we, then we instead of the gre we put these questions and it's like that describe your career interest and as well as short and long term professional goals if you put this uh, and also describe your research experience and skills and for example your specific roles in the research projects peer reviewed publications and oral poster presentation other research related experiences so and also explain the reasons for pursuing a graduate degree in pharmaceutical sciences and concentrate in the pharmacology or pharmaceutics and medical chemistry and provide additional information you are involved in the other extra curricular activities so these are the questions we put them here and we will look at because instead of the gre we will give the most of the weightage for these questions it's a similar like a gre but that's way when you want to do some research in the mind if while you are studying in the undergrad or formed in the pharmd as in the masters degree try to publish or try to present some research gain some experience research project that's a better way so that you can replace this one okay so these are the four questions is open and you can check in the online lot of the university in the us now they are going to change the trend from la from the i think it started last year but maybe they will continue forever because we feel not difference with the gre and without the gre we already saw in the one batch over now now i'm going to the application my university was led down was january 10th i think this year we will see how this goes this year and here is i provide the application timeline years in advance you should know explore your area of research interest and you should also develop the relationships with the professors who can write a letters for you okay develop the relationship with the letter and try to start your research little bit research and take a gre or tofel take a gre if is the gre is required in the future try to take a gre by november in every year try to take a gre and finish the tofel or ielts whatever you like it and identify the schools of interest 
and request a recommendation letter from your professors. Okay, by November time, you should finish all these things. In December or early January, you need to submit your application. And in February end or in early March, we will receive a notification for interview because in the once we get application by January 10th, uh, by January 15th, all the application first the university applications go to the university and in the common pool. They will separate to the different colleges. They will for us we get in after 10 December, January 10th, sometime 20. We will get the January 20 and we are a committee. We will review the applications and we, and we will give the scorings and then we'll I'll talk about the scoring, how we will give them and then call for the interview. And in the March end, we will finish the interviews also. Once we give the when we call them for the interview, we'll say that okay, we have the time for next two days or three days, you should come for the can you do come for the interview? And you may ask the question whether the two days is enough or not. Then I will talk about that to you. Okay. In the end of March, we will, you might receive the offer letter for the PhD program. We are offering the PhD program and so and so with a first stipend, fellowship, incidents, and all they will talk about you. And in the April end, you need to accept. They will give for, I believe it's a 45 days or 30 days. I'm not sure exactly, but they'll give enough time to make a decision because you will apply for different universities, right? You can compare which one is the best. So they'll give some time to accept by end of April. And in August, the university starts, the graduate program starts. Okay, this is application timeline. And is a, is a critical review. When you submit application by January 10th, sometimes, so what we will review, what we will focus on your application. What applications are, okay. So if you have the bachelor's degree or master's degree, we will look, give them for the 15% weightage. Like, the, for example, for the 100% 100 100 marks, we will give them for 15 marks, okay? For example, bachelor's degree or master's degree. And competitiveness or ranking of the institution. For example, university institute, what is this ranking institution in India, in, in the country, any country, it doesn't matter which country you are applying. So if you apply from the good university, we'll give them for the 10 out of 10. If it's 8 or 9, because as we are here, we don't know about the other university. You can say that this is the best university. And in uh, because this is the oldest university and strong, I know it's very competitive when we get into that university. You can say that this is the best university in pharmacy field and it was established so and so and and uh, the you know, professors are really great at so and so. You can tell them that we we will believe it for the for that and we'll check them, but but it's really not a problem at all. But you should highlight them. Even though if you are studying, for example, in the private colleges, don't write about your highlight your private colleges. You highlight the university. For example, if you're studying in the JNTU area, you can say that JNTU is the best or something like that. You can talk about that university and all. In, little bit about your institution. But we have because when you are in the committee in the uh, outside, they don't know which one, which, 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 which college you are studied and so many things. And GPA is a, your academic grades. How much per how much for example, if you get a hundred. Uh, if you get 90, something like yeah, 80, we'll, how much you will get? So we'll give them for 20% of the weightage. And essay and specific questions for the 40% or G, because I said that GRE we are going to remove, right? If you have GRE, we can give the GRE is a 40 marks. But if you don't have GRE, we are taking writing for the essay or specific questions, 40 marks. So for the essay rating, 40 marks, I said that you have to improve your build your CV, basically publish, publish, publish. If you are involved in the research, if you don't publish in the bachelor's degree, that's okay. But at least involve them research. You should type it, do the pipetting or some research you had a basic idea. And reference letters is a 10% of it. So here is 100 marks total. It's a 15, 25, 45, 85, 90, something like that. Out of 100, if you get around 80 or 75, you are good for the interview. Because we get hundreds of applications and then we'll take for uh, 20, 30 applications for one is three for the interview. Just try to be in the smart, in the top. 20 something like that 80 marks or 75 then you are good so you think about always when you're applying them and cv leadership is a five percent like extra curricular activities okay and the toefl is a minimum score we'll expect them some universities not expect them but some universities are expecting so it should be a 75 or ilts also enough if it is constant and that this this is not a problem and when we come for the interview Okay, I said that because if you look at all your application, when we'll give the scoring for this application, and then we'll go for the interview, right? We call them, okay, if we call for your interview or interested for the interview, you, will, you might say most of the time says, and you can, according to the Indian timings or China timing or Bangladesh timing, mostly we interview them with the Zoom, and we will record them, how they are, 
they are doing how the what is their communication skills because the scores it doesn't matter for us tofel jre they have very high scores but the communication is poor sometimes their attitude is not interactive and engaging so the communication skills are very important when during the interview it's the same for everywhere right every job and oral expressions are clear and concise so when you talk to them your oral expression should be you should talk to them clearly and you can answer the questions very clearly one to one answers don't go deep beyond that if they ask question just answer that question for example i say that i ask you one question uh when you got as a graduate student you are doing some research in the laboratory and you were you got not able to finish that experiment by 4 o'clock do you want to stop it and go away or you want to continue and go away we like for example we try to see how the evil responds most of the times they will say they will say in the all but we will see them their expression in their we will see their feeling we we'll guess definitely because we have experience how to do that so just to be careful when you answer them one to one questions okay so and because we will observe that whether they have fashion or not and open to explore the new research because for example if you apply in the pharmacology area you said that in the statement of purpose you said talk about something about the brain stroke and something but the problem is and the in the pharmacology of pharm- pharmacology not everybody do the brain research i do the kidney research somebody do the cancer research whether you are explored to the new research area what you write in the application you said that brain it is interested but a statement of purpose to talk about something some but you can also say we look ask them whether you are explored for the research because the opening is the, from the cancer research or the, from the kidney faculty so you should say that okay i'm interested for explore the new research because i studied the pharmacology i talk about so and so and pharmaco pharmaceutics same thing you can say something like that. and you should when we call for the interview you should no get look at their ample knowledge in the program for example if i call for the pharmaco pharmacology you apply for the pharmacology phd and you can look for the we have not too many faculty from pharmacology maybe 5 6 or maybe 10 max 8 look at the research what they are interested what because not everybody rules research right some people do the teaching some people or maybe senior they stop everything so look at them carefully whether they are active researchers they are publishing and all if they are publishing they might have some openings so look at their research some get some idea and good ability to answer technical questions how this technical questions comes because first thing we will ask you is do you have any research experience as a bachelor's degree you say that no sir i don't have any research experience and all it's uh, not good feeling for us so just as a master's degree you might have the project right you will explain them and we will ask a little bit about the your project and all see that we will try to understand something about you whether how much you are understand whether you are just shadowing you're just observer or you are involved in the research we'll see that thing so it's better to prepare for the technical question if you have project in the hand or just two three minutes presentation talk about something about your research so i would always i should recommend you to do involved with the research if you are really interested fashion for the phd program outside if everything is good you will be accepted within a month if is rejected if you are not good don't get disappointed okay and the first attempt you may not get it that's fine but try to that university if you are interested try to send the email to the faculty that okay i have applied and i interviewed but i am not get it interview and all just say that i will try my best for the next year that faculty keep in your name in the mind so try to make a rela- relationship if you are six months or one year or something happy new year send them messages they will they will accept you that's okay they will keep okay they will know that okay this guy is looking for me something like they keep in the mind but when you apply for the phd that's it makes a lot of help don't worry if you are rejected for first year go to the bachelor's degree go to the master's degree do masters submit the application they may might you might get but once you finish the master's degree you have the highest credit chance that you are because if you have master's degree we will directly take mostly i see that i when i interview them master's degree or bachelor's degree if they're smart we'll take them you know there is no rejection maybe one or two times they will reject you some third year definitely they will you'll get it definitely will keep in the mind okay and why is required uh, what is required to get a phd once you are congratulations if you get a phd so what we'll expect you in the two years you will get the training class work like for the example we will expect you to learn the advanced pharmacology 1 advanced pharmacology 2 what we learn in the bachelor's little bit of exp- little bit deep thing that and molecular pharmacology cellular pharmacology or biostatistics in two years you will learn this course work okay and teaching assistantship because you have to go for that if you get a teaching if you are accepted paid by teaching assistantship we expect you to work for 20 hours for 20 hours right so 
and you need to finish at the end of the 22 uh, years you need to finish the qualifying exam this exam when of the exam we will we will you will form we will form as a committee we will for you we will form as a committee five member faculty committee this committee will give you the some questions in the area of published papers they will ask give you and they will ask you to read them and they will and they will produce an exam so once you qualifying this exam some people can end up here as a master's degree you can say that okay i am not interested to the phd i want to stop here then you will go with a good with a masters and go away instead of you come here to the us and do the masters and paying 30 lakhs it's not used compared to this phd just do these things and masters degree and go away or you can continue the research or if you are good with a qualifying exam you want to continue do research third year fourth year and publish some papers and done and publish papers if possible try to publish at least one paper from the master phd program and and uh, write your thesis and you are done with that okay this is the phd uh, program and uh, once you finish a phd program in the uh, us or uh, is the same like in india also and this is a uh, is the same for example if you are finishing your phd program for india i'm going to talk about the careers okay in the us what we are looking and uh, if you finish the phd program so we will offer you as a post doctoral position so you can work at the university under professor in the research project for example for example like i say when i did my masters degree a um, uh, graduate program in germany i sent the cv in the night and then when i slept and next day morning i got an offer in my mail you are accepted for the post doctoral position in the lab they just accepted because during my master uh, my, my graduate program i published four papers in the good impact journal like seven or eight impact journal and some of them are three four but is a good, very good competitive papers so they accepted me within a day uh, just uh, i slept in the night and next day morning i offer is there i was so stunned i don't know that it's, it's so easy to go to the us after the phd program and all phd program so or if you are in india like see well, dr virabelli just discussed that dr koteshwar rao vira uh, nalamolu and uh, go and uh, Ch challa shwaradi right they also came as a post doctoral fellow started because they have fashion to something they are really they remove, remove the career in they left it there at the hod of the in india and even for me right now with me one post doctor dr govardhan puchakala he is working with me he studied the masters in uh, our andhra university under professor rajeshwar rao he studied pharmacology and and after he did worked as a hod in the varangal for 12 i think 8 yeah 10 years nearly 10 years and he quit the program hod and when i call when he called me he said that i am not happy with my current college i am going to the hyderabad for different college i said why you are going to hyderabad college just come to the us i sent them offer letter within a day or two i just talked to them because he has the interest i know about him in the during the masters degree in andhra university so we had relationship and we know we observed them right so like that if you are interested you can contact the faculty and post docs and all just send them if you are phd in the research in india right now just try to contact the relationship if you are the first year second year doesn't matter start to maintain the relationships and and some people go to the post doc and some people directly go to the after phd program here if you finish the phd program some people directly go to the faculty at the research universities because if you finish a phd program in the us you can directly go to the research universities it's very get into the very hard to get into the research university but if you have several years of the post doctor experience you have chance to go to the research university if you have some funding while you are in the post doctoral fellow if you are getting some grant fellowship and it's a k99 fellowship in the us with their grant you can directly go to the research universities and you can do the mostly 90 70% of the research and teaching is 20% service is 10% teaching 20% means it's a 30 hours for a year teaching 30 hours for a year whole, whole year teaching and 70% you do research and a service 10 hours is a very limited service okay and private job some people if they finish the phd post doc here in the us they are phd directly they can go to the private schools as a teaching schools they do the teaching is a 70% they will teach for the osteopathic medicine at the pharmacy colleges private colleges or some colleges they will go there and teach them or they have to do research is a minimal research with them 20% of the research and is i said 70% research here 70% right teaching schools in the private school it's not like every day teaching it's a 50 hours for a semester probably or 60 hours for semester that's that's all semester means is a four months so it's not too much 
for the for sorry for a year for a year 70 years 70 hours nearly that's all and service it's not like a private colleges here every year teaching or something it's not like that or uh, if you are interested you can go to the federal government institution like fda in here it's a food and drug administration to approve the clinical trials and all as a reviewer i mean not directly go to the reviewer directly but you can as a uh, you can uh, once you finish the phd program or you can have the first year of the second year of the postdoctoral position you can go for as the postdoc in the fda first and then one or two years you do the postdoc and they will take you as a reviewer it's a government job is a is a central government job here and you can directly go to the pharmaceutical industry jobs if you are a scientist or you can go as a group leader or clinical research if you are interested these are the careers is and i wanted to i will wind up with one or two slides and then i'll stop my research and take your questions because that's very important if i can answer you any, any of your question if you are not interested to the us don't get disappointed if you didn't get admission you apply for one year two year three year doesn't matter you didn't get it don't get disappointed if you have real real fashion i will show you other way to get to the phd okay and you can apply the phd program in the europe in the europe i am not going to talk too many other countries i don't know them honestly i know the one country i did because i did my phd with a masters degree in europe in germany in the germany they will requirement is a masters degree from india you do pharmacology or pharmaceutics or if you do the msc biotechnology it's just a ba normal bsc msc right b msc biotechnology or pharmaceutical chemistry if you do any of these things you can apply for the phd program in india and how to get into here in europe just send your cv i said network network start looking the papers and send your cv to the faculty i am mean, doing so and so research here my masters thesis is this and this is not for bachelor's degree i would say only for the master students or master students basically so just send them email Uh, send them emails because before it's hard to get to the contact the faculty but because no internet and all before 2000 now it's easy so send them a hun, uh, something like a 20 email response negative response that's okay and another 20 negative response don't get disappointed submit them 200 300 400 doesn't matter definitely you will get in some point you will never lose it if you are really fashion if you are really interested just you will definitely get it keep submitting negative result come very fast but the first two things will come very slowly don't get disappointed if you have fashion to do stipend health insurance they will give you the full stipend and in the europe the stipend is different than the us in the europe they will pay like 900 euros and they will pay the health insurance in the europe if they give if they give the 900 euros it will cost you around 200 euros is the expenses and the remaining 700 like you can save for at least 80000 something like 30 i'm not sure right now i cannot compare this money i forgot about it but you can save them at least 40 50000 $50, rupees for a month you can save it as a phd degree when you enter after a masters degree instead of applying to the some pharmacy private colleges in india and do a phd in india and struggling at all just submit the phd or masters degree and send the cv for a maybe 20 30 40 or 100 200 you will get it there and you will get a stipend health insurance and course work if you do the masters msc biotechnology is a six months course is required just six months is not every day it's one hour for maybe for a week or two weeks is a six months course if you do msc but if you study the masters pharmacy like pharmacology or biochemistry Uh, biotechnology or pharmacognosy or pharmaceutics no course work in germany okay the duration is 3 to 4 years maximum i finished my phd in the 2 years within 2 years 2 months in germany because i would say my story here little bit because i studied from germany when i got a problem with the germany i i just go to the europe and europe there is no no course work and all nothing just to start research and when i was there i am alone i am single and not married i have plenty of time when i am working in the lab from the morning 9 to 6 6:30 uh, sometimes my faculty was so surprised how your fashion for this because i struggled in india i know how pain it is i do the research in india for one year and wasted your time and go to the different country i know the pain so i took that within two years i finished my phd and and after the, when i was in phd he said that you you are you doing good you can recommend me some students from india 
I help for six students to do the PhD. Then they are just in the master's degree in India, and just I help them to. They just send me a CV and we accepted them without my 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 professor. He said, "I believe you. I trust you." And then just they finish the PhD. So if you're fashion, definitely you will get somewhere else. You will end up with somewhere else. So at the end, I wanted to acknowledge to all the faculty. They gave me the education in the bachelor's degree and master's degree, and uh, the my research was started with Dr. Professor Anapurna. She give she is very humble professor, and she never forced you to do this that that. She is very she will talk little but do good things. Okay, so I'm very thankful to my mentor, Dr. Anapurna. And also, I want to meet. I'm very happy with my classmates and friends. They give me a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun in the library. It's a lot. We I cannot talk too much about. <laughs> I never forget my my stay at on the university. This is really fun. Okay. And also, I without mentioning my guru, my mentor, I'm not going to finish it. Is Professor S. Tatanarayana. He is the one taking me to the PhD program and started. He asked me to start the day one after my master's degree. So I'm really thankful to Professor S. Tatanarayana. And then, uh, when I was in the trouble, started with my PhD with uh, Dr. Satyanarayana did for one and a half year, and we had problem with uh, on the university to continue my PhD. And he is my guru, another guru is a Srinivas Nami. He helped me to take me to Germany. He was uh, finished a PhD with Professor Satyanarayana. That time, when I am studying with the masters and all, I work. I try to watch his relation. I made a good friendship with Dr. Nami during that time, and. He helped me when he go to the PhD program in uh, postdoc in the Germany. He take me there to the East Lab as a PhD student. I'm really thankful to him. Without him, I may not get the PhD there. That time, maybe I change my mind. I'm not sure about where I will be end up. Okay, so I'm just thankful to him. And also, Dr. Ishak Kumar and Dr. Ramesh Aluri and Sushruta Kopla, Rajeshwar Jaladi. We these are all my friends, and we have a lot of fun to going to the beach and talk to the. Uh, Go for the tea in the evenings, and uh, Dr. Satyanar and I took me to the in the faculty club for tea and discussion. So many things we had a lot of fun. I am really thankful to Dr. Professor Satyanar and students, and also the hardworking students, Dr. Krishna Viravelli and Murli Krishna Devi. These are very student hardworking. They work with Dr. Anupurna during the PhD program. We are all fun. We had a lot of we enjoyed. Even though I was there for one year, but we had a good time. And also, I want to say thankful to my wife, Dr. Sai Sudha Koka. She did a master's thesis with Dr. Professor Anupurna. Purna, and now she is a faculty in the U.S. She is also did PhD in Germany, and I also thankful to her. And also now the current Govardhan Pushkala is working as a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. Last three years, now I asked him to find a job in the industry. He is in the process to move to the industry soon. He is looking for a job. So with that, I will take your questions. Anything? So any questions? Can I take? I am happy to take any questions and. Dr. Krishna Viravelli also can uh, jump in if you have any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving a lot of information for the people who are wishing to seek admission in the USA and Europe. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure, sir. I know the pain, sir. It's uh, getting the PhD. It's really. I feel like it's hard to get into the PhD program in the US and India. But as I am in the committees, I know how it's easy to get into. because mm. i am very feel very sad that i am not able to see any application from the andhra or kakatiya i am see the application from other countries they are not even the standards are not meeting to me even i was feel sometimes bad about them but always we look for the see good candidates if they are fashion if they are really interested please recommend to my university or other universities and when for not only the graduate students even the scholars if they are they have the skills Krishnamurti, sir. If they are really good students, they get jobs in uh, their native countries. <laughs> 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 they, don't, they don't go abroad. I agree. I love. If they are in the really, sometimes I feel regretting why I'm here in India. Also, <laughs> now, now it's a change in India. I agree with you, sir. Definitely. <laughs> okay. My my three daughters are abroad, but uh, I want to. I I wish them to get back. <laughs> that's never happens anymore it's a before you come to the us make a decision whether you want to stay back or you go back never happens go back going back india i would say i, I, I don't to... i don't uh, i don't want them to go go abroad get trained get get back get so, trained back. 
so i did a mistake to give this presentation then good good you have given a lot of information to the youngsters thank you sir it's my pleasure sir yeah right uh, any questions from the participants i can happily take yeah. in and other we can ask thank you krishnamurthy i think uh, madam uh, vijayaratha madam is there online oh madam for oh, some questions i am there yeah yes yes madam yes namaste madam nenu krishna kumar nandi how are you i am chaala santosham mi andarki cheyadam namaskaram madam namaskaram andi baagundara andi krishna kumar baagunnara chaala baagundi mi andar speech lu vindam mi andarni chooddam chaala happy mee intlo unnan madam nenu 3 samvatsaralu pe avunu avunu ninna mee photo choodagane gurtu chestunnan nenu mimalni mee chaala unnarandi gurtu chestunnan baagunnana ma మేడం నేను గుర్తున్నాను అండి మీకు కృష్ణమూర్తి తప్పకుండా మీరు మీ మిస్సెస్ కూడా థాంక్యూ మేడం థాంక్యూ అండి యా థాంక్యూ సో మచ్ అండి వి ఆర్ సో హ్యాపీ యాక్చువల్లీ వి గాట్ ఎ గుడ్ బేసిక్ సపోర్ట్ ఫ్రమ్ ది ఇన్ రియల్ ఎస్టేట్ ఇట్స్ ఎ వండర్ఫుల్ టాక్ కేఎం యాక్చువల్లీ ఇట్ ఇస్ ఇట్ ఇస్ ఆల్ వాట్ ది స్టూడెంట్స్ నీడ్ ఇస్ నెట్వర్కింగ్ ఇఫ్ దే హావ్ ప్యాషన్ దే నీడ్ నెట్వర్కింగ్ దే అటెండ్ నీడ్ టు అటెండ్ కాన్ఫరెన్సెస్ యు కాంటాక్ట్ ద యు Uh, foreign speakers you keep in touch with them uh, if you have interest see the, i took sivareddy challa he was uh, he sent me an email in 2013 at that time i don't have money to take anybody but it happened in 2018 so like that uh, like if you have passion you focus on networking you explore the stuff there are plenty of opportunities and uh, mm-hmm. like uh, km I, i also got in one day i sent uh, uh, application and next day i got the offer letter so it, it happens for a phd uh, if you are already phd but for graduate students uh, there will be a lot of process uh, there will be interview process and all that but if it is post doc uh, if the person you are applying has money it just happens that's true let us see if, if is anybody has the participants have the questions from that side yeah um, uh, good afternoon all this is gauda am okay. i able to all yes sir yes, gauda yeah. thank you sir um, dr boyne sir um, thank you for your excellent talk on the opportunities for the uh, post graduation and phd at us as well as europe it's a wonderful talk for the young generation Uh, i would like to take this uh, stage to convey my sincere pranamas to my guru uh, dr um, professor ss n garu uh, because i used to hear your name kk sir name and as well as jaladira shekar and ishwar sir name because we groaned while seeing their hard work in research department in pharmacology department uh, so uh, i have one question to you um, is there any duration or the limitation post phd by this time they have to get post doc like 3 years or other 5 years there is nothing usually, usually within 5 years you should you, you should be able to get post doc position within 5 years after phd but after 5 years it will be really tough but uh, but if you know no people and if they are interested in you they find passion in you if they are uh, convinced uh, with your passion there is a possibility that is how i took uh, dr nalamolu and uh, dr uh, sivareddy so they are almost 10 years after phd but they have passion they left uh, everything they they achieved and they they came and they worked as a fresh post docs it is not easy i would have not done that if i am in their place so the, <laughs> that shows uh, if you have such a passion you you will achieve it i would say one more to krishna ravale i agree with the five years limitation is very important but as in the us don't think about age is also consideration as a post doctoral fellow if you want a one year experience or two years experience you can in the university that's fine you can come here do research and go back to with the project and you can do there or uh, if you want to do go to industry probably if come here and do some research couple of year publications and make a network and then go to the industry also possible little bit but it's a it's a minimal a possibility but it's a, it's a little bit yeah i agree it's possible sometimes. so uh, add to that gauda uh, there is a possibility always uh, if you do the relevant research suppose if you are in the same field of research and continuing your work post phd it doesn't matter the uh, how many years it is uh, yeah i want to add a little bit to this because uh, 
if you are in uh, one like uh, for uh, for example if you are in pharmacology so it it may not uh, it may not help you directly to get a position because we need different kind of position uh, for example i do stroke surgeries i if i am putting an advertisement to recruit a person with some experience in animal surgeries i can't take everybody who applies to me everybody may be from pharmacology everybody may be from andhra university but uh, for specific positions sometimes we look for speci specific expertise if we if you don't have that uh, don't get disappointed uh, eventually we will have positions uh, that uh, suits to your background Uh, thank hey, you, sir. Uh, for, uh, you. I have an additional question uh, along with this. So, what is the probability for the industrial guys who is pursuing currently post PhD? Maybe more than five years. They already spent more than five years in industry post PhD. So, what is the probability? Is it yeah, must that, from the it, academic it orientation or as the is uh, that is what I am telling you, uh, Dr. Gowda. It is possible because you have to. Keep in contact with the people. The person who want to recruit you should be convinced with you. That's all. That's all you need. I got it. I can also dig in one question, one thing to you. Because if we, if we contact some young faculty, they may not take you because they may think that, okay, this guy is already senior. I may do research if he has a passion or he spent the time in the lab at all. Sometimes it's difficult for that. If you are looking for the lab, it's a big lab. Sometimes that's possible is also. Yeah. But uh, always the five years is good. But if you are already in the industry in India, I have just one, I can add one thing. If you are in the industry for a couple of years and if you come here as a one year or two years, uh, because from India industry to directly to US industry is not possible. And But if you come here as a postdoc for one, two, three years and if you have some networking and you get like, some green card and all, if you have publications, then you can go to industry with your uh, previous experience. Sometimes that's on their way. Is agree? Is it true? Know, unless you know somebody really, it it won't happen after five years because what we see after doing PhD after five years, you settle in some field. You won't fit to really work at bench like a like a fresh postdoc. We Thank expect you. lot of work. We expect lot of commitment. We do animal work. You may need to come on weekends to take the data. See, by the time you are you spend five years after PhD, yeah. you you must be married. You might have got kids. A lot of responsibilities. So as young, young investigators, we want people who who work who really spend time in the lab and generate yeah. data. Krishna, Krishna Kumar, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, yes, uh, the other speaker is uh, waiting. Uh, we can continue uh, the discussion in some other platform. Uh, sure. I think uh, if, if there are any. Uh, we are available. Other, uh, students, students can send yes, email to us. Yes, yes, yes. We'll create another platform uh, for uh, more uh, discussion. And uh, now, if there are any more uh, uh, participants who want to. Put questions, post questions. Chat box. Questions are there in chat box? Dr. Krishna Kumar. Dr. Krishna Kumar. Yeah, somebody is uh, speaking. Yeah. Dr. Krishna Kumar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Raj Kumar from Andhra University from White Community Pharmaca Hi, Dr. Raj Kumar. Hi, hi, how are you? So when we're doing your arm form, you are doing your PhD work under uh, Madam Annapurna Madam. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, I'm relative of a Professor D. Venkatrogar. So DKM gets a little My father is a co-brother to Professor D. Venkatrogar. Okay. I'm, I'm junior to you. Uh, okay, nice to meet you all of you. One question. So at the current situation of Corona is concerned, what is the strong uh, herbal remedy which will suppress the uh, what are called COVID symptoms or what, what is the best remedy for COVID? Rajkumar, 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 remedy. Rajkumar, sorry for the interruption. You can ask that uh, question later because the other uh, speaker is waiting. Uh, right. Yes, it is. Uh, right, sir, right, sir. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry for that. Sorry for that uh. Okay, okay, no problem. Right, right. right. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Krishnamurti, uh, for your uh, excellent uh, talk. And uh, I think uh, most of our uh, students will, uh, get, uh, will get a benefit out of it. Definitely, they will uh, approach you, both of you, Krishna Kumar as well as uh, Krishna, Krishna Murthy, for their uh, career uh, uh, guidance. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll guide them to 
contact you for their uh, future uh, uh, prospectus in US. Thank you, thank you for, for your uh, uh, talk. Thank you. So sir. now, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Dr. Nazib. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. How are you, Dr. Yeah. Nazib? I'm fine, thanks. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> After a long time. Yeah, yeah. I've met you before. Great to see you, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now I'll ask our uh, Professor uh, uh, Girija Shankar, uh, our uh, faculty chairman, to introduce uh, Professor Nazib. Please, sir. Yeah. Girija Shankar. Yeah. Is it, uh, is it audible? Is it okay? Is it audible? Okay. Yes. Ah, yes, yes. So, respected uh, dignitaries of the webinar and uh, the audience of the webinar, good afternoon to all of you. This is uh, Professor Girija Shankar, faculty chairman, AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Nazib bin Saleh, who is the keynote speaker of the, today's uh, webinar. And Dr. Najib Saleh is currently an associate professor in physiology at the University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia. He graduated with the MBBS from University of Malaya, Malaysia in the year 2000 and obtained a PhD in reproductive physiology from King's College, University London in 2005. In addition to this, he also possesses a postgraduate certificate in academic practice from King's College London 2005 and postgraduate diploma in family medicine from Christian Medical College Veluru in 2018. Dr. Saleh has extensive experience in the teaching of physiology at both undergraduate and clinical postgraduate students. And he received the best physiology lecturer award from University of Malaya in 2017. In addition to the teaching, Dr. Saleh is an active researcher in the field of endocrine and reproductive physiology with a special interest in understanding the mechanism underlying the male and female infertility. He also extended his interest in investigating the pharmacological effect of tropical and subtropical herbs in the treatment of metabolic disorders, that is diabetes mellitus, and also studied neurological and mechanisms underlying the salt hypersensitive hypertension that is. Dr. Saleh published around 77 papers in various uh, peer-reviewed uh, high impact factor journals and is the sole corresponding author around 72 of these publications. He successfully supervised around 12 PhD students and 13 masters students in the field of endocrine and reproductive physiology. And he is also the coordinator physiology of the postgraduate programs and he has been involved in formulating national biotechnology policy for the Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation of Malaysia in 2021. So with this, uh, uh, now uh, we request uh, uh, Dr. Nazib to give his talk on Marantides Pumilim, a potential help to ameliorate hyperglycemia and osteoporosis in postmenopausal women with diabetes. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity today on this occasion. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Prof. Thank you, Prof. I would like to share my screen now. Uh, is it possible to see? Not yet. Oh. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to see my screen? No, no, not yet. No chair, yeah. Yes. Second chair. Uh, okay, hold on. Yeah. Now? Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now it is visible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm very grateful for the invitation by Dr. Iswa Kumar. Uh, for to, to, to contribute to this uh, seminar today. And I would like to share with you uh, the topics that is related to the seminar, to the, to the uh, seminar today, which is related to the herb. One of the herb that I have been working on for many years uh, here in Malaysia is uh, known as Kache Fatima in the local language or scientifically known as Marantodes pumilum. Okay, we studied this herb as, uh, as anti-hyperglycemic agent 
and also as an anti osteoporotic agent in uh, rat models of postmenopause women uh, with or without diabetes. So I would like to start my talk with this. Uh, the location of our country is in the equator. So we are uh, we have dense tropical rainforests. As you can see, that uh, the floor of the rainforest is full of different different types of animals and different types of plants, which can be utilized for medicinal purposes. So, if you look at the biodiversity of the tropical rainforest, you can see, uh, for example, I compare with my neighboring country, Indonesia, which has the almost the same size of USA. So you can see how how they have more diverse plants uh, species when compared to the moderate climate. So that shows that there's a lot of potentials to uh, explore about the benefits of a lot of different herbs that you can access from this uh, tropical rainforest. So one of the tropical uh, herbs that of my interest is called Marantodes pumilum, or previously it is also called Labisia pumila. So in local names, it is uh, known as Cache Fatima, and some, sometimes it's also called Seluso Fatima and Balanca Sultan and so on. It is actually a flowering, a small woody leafy plant with leaves of about 20 cm in length, and it grows widely in the shade of the tropical forest floor. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you you can. Yeah. yeah. So the claim uh, benefits of these herbs include, sorry, the claim benefits of these herbs uh, include it uh, mostly for the well-being of women, uh, mainly in drive, uh, increasing the women libido, and reducing vaginal discharge and reduces mucus. Uh, discharge and also uh, for regularized menstruation, it reduces the menstrual pain, eliminates uh, unpleasant odors, uh, facilitate childbirth, and also it overcome menopause symptoms. Apart from that, it also uh, used to heal the vagina after delivery, tighten the vaginal muscles after childbirth, lowering cholesterol, and this, uh, it also claimed to can help to strengthening the bone. So this is the 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 the, the form of the, the the most widely used form, which is the leaves, which where it is uh, traditionally traditionally used uh, in the decoction as a decoction drink. So they prepare it by boiling. So uh, before that, I would like to explain a bit on the uh, woman. Uh, this it uh, what do you call that the. Uh, symptoms of menopause that is of the concern in many women after uh, after menopause the, the symptoms include uh, mostly related to the uh, their, their reproductive functions mainly like loss of libido vaginal dryness uh, irregular menstruation and then ultimately having amenorrhea and then they also complain of joint pain weakening of the bones like osteoporosis, then they have brittle nails. They can also have some uh, symptoms related to the cardiovascular functions, hair loss, uh, and then itchiness and uh, skin dryness, night sweat. And these are some of the common symptoms that is related to menopause. So, uh, so one of the benefits of this plant is trying to help to alleviate uh, the symptoms related to uh, menopause. So, what happens in menopause is that there is a decline in estrogen levels in women. So, menopause occur at around the age of 50 years, where there is a sharp drop of estrogen levels due to the uh, diminishing ovarian reserve. So, at the uh, after menopause, there is a very low levels of estrogen, which contribute to the uh, symptoms that the woman experience. So these are all uh, troublesome symptoms that they need to, uh, to uh, and encounter every day in their life and they need to bear with it. So uh, what, what they're being used now is uh, the hormone replacement therapy 
which con consists of either estrogens alone or combined estrogen and progesterone. There are different different forms of estrogen, like conjugated estrogen, micronized estradiol, transdermal estradiol, uh, estrogens uh, combined with progestin, and even depot progestin alone. Okay, these are the conventional therapy for menopause. Uh, there are a lot of uh, benefits. However, at the same time, it poses a lot of risks for the woman. Uh, like the, the, the short-term benefits is that these uh, conventional drugs can control symptoms within days or weeks and improve the mood. And the long-term benefits include keeps the bone healthy, reducing the risk of osteoporosis and fractures, and the reduce, reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and also it could help to protect memory loss and possibly alzheimer's disease and reduce the risk of bowel cancer however there are a lot of risks associated with hrt include uh, risk of deep vein thrombosis increase the risk of cardiovascular women if the hrt is started after the age of 60 and especially for those women who are uh, at the same time smoking being overweight or having high blood pressure or high cholesterol and there is a small increase in breast cancer risk after 60 years old, 60 years of uh, age, and there is a slight increase in the risk of gallstones. So one of the uh, complications that is related to menopause is osteoporosis. So if you can see from the graph, the, the incidence of osteoporosis uh, rise sharply after menopause in women. As compared to men, it is much lower incidence. So osteoporosis is defined as the uh, softening of the bone where the bone lost its normal uh, texture. So that especially affects the woven bone. And it's, to a certain extent, it can also affect the cortical bones. Apart from that, there is also a report that menopause can be associated with increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So there's a report uh, in articles which show that early and premature menopause in women uh, make them at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But instead of that, the relationship between diabetes and menopause is still not well studied. So it has been uh, found that more than 10% of menopause women are living with diabetes worldwide. And in a study in France, they found that, that 5 to 8% of all menopause women uh, they are uh, with HRT, they are at the same time being treated with diabetes. So uh, a lot of herbal remedies in as an alternative treatment uh, of menopause has been used worldwide. At the same time, it is very common yeah, that, that herbs is being used uh, to treat diabetes, yeah, uh, including in all these, uh, mainly in Asian uh, countries. So herbs is widely used in the treatment of uh, this chronic metabolic disease. So the question is that we are we're looking at is whether uh, the herb of our interest could help to overcome both uh, menopause and at the same time diabetes so what we do we, we do is that uh, the previously we studied the effects of this herb uh, on diabetes alone to look whether there is uh, some potential antihyperglycemic action of these herbs so we look at uh, this study was conducted several years ago where it shows that uh, using a cell culture, which is the adipocyte cell lines, uh, we found that the uh, upon administration of the Marantodespumilum extract, there is an increase in the uptake of glucose into the cells. So this is just a representative image, and this is the analysis that have been made. So that shows that this herb has the ability to increase the uptake of glucose uh, into the cell and reduce the or lowers the fast uh, the blood glucose levels. Apart from that, uh, a, an in vivo studies we we also perform an in vivo studies in male diabetic rat models, uh, where we found that administration of the herbs 
uh, helps to reduce the fasting blood glucose levels after 28 days. This is the normal uh, control. Well, so once you administer the the marantodes pumilum to the obrectomized obrectomized rats is the uh, sorry this is a male rats yeah so this is uh, we use the male rat model first so when we administer to the male diabetic rats it can help to reduce the uh, fasting blood glucose levels close to normal after four weeks of treatment and in terms of insulin uh, it, it, it was found that the administration of marantodes pumilum uh, could help to increase the serum insulin levels significantly in male diabetic rat models after four weeks of treatment. So we then look at the whether the actions of this herb uh, can be mediated by improving the pancreatic function. And what we found that uh, yeah, there is uh, this herb can help to ameliorate pancreatic damage once it is being administered at a uh, uh early stage of development of diabetes in male rats so uh in in terms of histopathological changes that occur uh, administration of the herbs can reduce the changes significantly as compared to the non-treated animals so we also look at the insulin expression in the pancreatic beta islets uh, uh, islets of langerhans and we found that administration of this herb helps to increase expression of insulin in the pancreatic islets. Apart from that, uh, it also helped to uh, reduce oxidative stress in the pancreatic islets by increasing the antioxidant NRF2 and uh, some of the antioxidants enzymes like catalase and uh, GPX, glutathione peroxidase uh, proteins in the pancreas. And we also found that uh, Marantodes pumilum could help to reduce inflammation induced by diabetes in, in the pancreatic uh, islets in uh, diabetic animals. So here it shows that there is less uh, brown stain once the diabetic male rats is being treated with uh, this herbs, herbal extract. So this is the apoptosis protein, which also shows uh, increase in the levels of pro-apoptosis protein in diabetic group, which is the VEX, and is being reduced significantly upon administration of the extract, while the anti-apoptosis protein, which is low in diabetic group, is increased following administration of the uh, herbal extract. And then, uh, then uh, after that, we, we, we did an experiment in female rat models. So the female rats that we use uh, is the, the sprig dolly uh, 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 rats, which we obrectomized 12 weeks prior to uh, experiment. So the purpose of obrectomy is to remove both ovaries uh, in order to eliminate the effect of endogenous sex steroids. So we, we don't want the endogenous estradiol to interfere with the results because we want to see whether this uh, herbs uh, has some estrogen-like activities or, or phytoestrogenic activities. Yes, the, we, we divide the models into two. Either we don't induce diabetes or we induce them uh, with diabetes via injecting streptozotocin at 55 milligram and nicotine amide to limit the damage to the pancreas, thus creating the type 2 diabetes. And then we measured the fasting blood glucose levels. So this is the non-diabetic models, post-menopause non-diabetic models. And the second one is the menopause diabetic models. And then after confirmation of diabetes or after 21 days post-ovrectomy, we give the herbs. And then by the end of 28 days, we assess uh, either the reproductive organs, which is the vagina here, and then the bones. And also we take uh, blood for assessment of fasting blood glucose, insulin, and other metabolic parameters. So looking at the effects of these herbs, sorry, on the uh, vagina, it increased significantly the vaginal thickness. 
So this shows that this is the overactomized models, which means that this rat is deficient in estrogen, uh, resembling postmenopause condition. So administration of uh, herbs or uh, amaranthodes pumilum uh, help to increase the thickness of the vagina epithelium. So there's, that shows that uh, the, it has some estrogen-like effects because we know that estrogen is the only hormones that can increase the thickness of the vaginal epithelium, where in postmenopausal state, uh, the vaginal epithelia will be very thin and that contributes to the symptoms like vaginal dryness uh, that is being experienced. Apart from that, we also see that the proliferative protein, which is expressed in the vagina, is increased following administration of Maranto Despomilum, which is compatible to that of estradiol. So other than that, we have also assessed the levels of other proteins that contribute to the uh, restoration of fluidity or uh, and they call that uh, to prevent dryness in the vaginal lumen, including uh, occludin. Occludin is a tight junction proteins uh, that uh, prevent water movement from the lumen into the stroma, so that restore the vaginal the fluidity or environment as normal. So it prevents the vaginal dryness. This is the electron microscopic image, which shows that increase. Uh, uh, what they call that uh, uh, tightness of the tight junction okay uh, in between the cells so that shows that there is a uh, big uh, water flowing out from the lumen is prevented uh, in estrogen following estrogen treatment and that is what we also encountered when we gave the uh, marantodes pumila and the other protein transporters that involve in the fluid or water movement out from uh, into the vaginal lumen, so like acoporin. Acoporin is the uh, protein that participates in water movement from the blood vessels into the lumen of an organ, including in the vagina. So there is increased expression of both acoporin isoform 1 and acoporin isoform 2, uh, and which resembles that of estrogen. So that means that, uh, that shows that this herb has the ability to restore the uh, fluid environment in the vagina and prevent vaginal dryness from developing under sex steroid deficient conditions. And we also look at the uh, expression of proton uh, uh, extruder protein, which is VATPase. Uh, so we, we we know that under uh, before menopause the womb, the vaginal pH is acidic, so after menopause that reduced acidity contribute to change in the uh, flora in the vagina that leads to increased risk of like urinary tract infection in postmenopausal women. So that's there is increase in the expression of uh, this protein which restores the vaginal acidity after menopause. And then we also look at the we also look at the other metabolic profiles in the postmenopausal female rats with diabetes. So similarly, when we give uh, this is the non-treated, and then when we give the extract, we show it shows that the levels of uh, fasting blood glucose falls uh, significantly after twenty eight days. Similarly, insulin levels also arise. Uh, when compared to the diabetic group, there is non-treated group, there is a low insulin levels that is increased following treatment with, with estrogen as well as with the extract. This is the glybenclamide, which is the conventional anti-diabetic drugs. And uh, then we explore on the bone markers, serum bone markers. Uh, which include calcium phosphate and bone alkaline phosphatase levels. So the calcium levels is restored when we give the extract. And this is the positive control and the glabenclamide treatment and together with phosphate. So these two ions are important for bone formation. And then the bulk levels increase, which shows there is some uh, Osteolytic activities happening in the bone uh, in the untreated rats. Once you give the extract, the 
uh, the activity, osteo osteolytic activities decrease significantly. So before I explain on the other findings, I would just like to explain a little bit more details on the bone uh, remodeling process. So the remodeling process here involved the two important bone cells, which namely osteoblast and osteoclast. And this osteoclast is involved in the bone resorption, while osteoblast is involved in bone formation. So there are three important proteins that is being released yeah, from uh, two from the osteoblast and one receptors which is sitting on the osteoclast. So the two proteins that is being released from the osteoblast are the uh, RANKL and OPG. Yeah, there's this quite a long name here, uh, osteoprotogenin, and this is also a very long name. So we used to call it RANKL, RANKL, and then this is the uh, this is the rank. The rank which is produced and the rankle is the 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 rank is the receptor for the rankle. The, so the rank is sitting on the osteoclast. So activation of osteoclast requires the rank uh, the rankle to binds to rank. So which activates the bone resorption process. So this, however, is being inhibited once there's a lot of OPG release because OPG will neutralize the rank the rankle thus preventing the binding of rankle to rank. So this is the basic uh, activities that happens in the bone uh, during the remodeling process. Apart from that, there is another pathways that involve in bone deposition, which involve the WNT, beta catenin signaling pathways. So activation of WNT, beta, beta catenin will increase the levels of OPG so once the levels of OPG increase, it will neutralize the rankle and prevents rankle from binding to rank, and that inhibits osteoclast activation. So that will reduce bone resorption. So that's what estrogen did. Uh, estrogen does uh, before menopause, where it, it, it induced the the product synthesis of OPG, which increased its uh, inhibition on the osteoclast activity, and looking deep into the uh, mechanisms how the uh, WNT works is that once WNT binds to the uh, receptor, so with the, it has two receptors, is, which is called LRP receptors, which is combined with the intracellular proteins like GSK3 beta. Yeah. So once in, uh, if, if the WNT is not active, so this uh, beta catenin, uh, which is a mediator in, inside the cells, will be uh, will bind to GSK3 beta and and being phosphorylated. So this beta catenin will be degraded. So that's prevent activation or transcription of the gene. So once the WNT is being activated, so it will combine with the receptor LRP and this uh, complex will dissociate, leaving behind beta catenin free inside the cytoplasm, and the beta catenin will then uh, move into the nucleus and transcribe the gene, which leads to production of OPG that inhibits the osteoclast activity. So this the detailed pathway involves the other proteins like DVL and so on. Yeah. So this these these are the proteins that we are going to assess in the bones. So first, we look at the how these herbs can uh, ameliorate the uh, histological damage in the bone trabecular network. So if you look at the uh, diabetic rats, you cannot see there's a destruction of the trabecular network. Uh, however, when you give the extract, there is some restoration of the trabecular network, and this is the estrogen treatment. And this is another way of looking the collagen, which is an important protein component of the bone. So there is a reduced collagen content in the non-treated group. However, the collagen content is restored to normal once you give the herbal treatment uh, as comparable to that of estrogen. And if you look at the collagen in the woven bone, the bluish stain, which shows the collagen content, which is markedly reduced 
in the non-treated group while it's being restored back in the uh, group that received treatment incompatible to that of estradiol or estrogen. So just now where I explained about the rank rankel OPG pathway, so the rank levels is uh, the rank levels which is rank which is produced. This is the receptor, so it's increased, but the rankle levels is reduced by the extract. So the less rankle, less activation of the osteoclast and the OPG levels also being increased by the extract treatment, where we have more OPG, so less uh, more inhibition of the osteoclast, so there will be less bone resorption. So this is the immunohistochemistry that we perform, which shows the findings where rank and OPG proteins uh, markedly increase uh, in the treated uh, group, uh, resemble that of the estrogen treatment. Apart from that, we also look at the whether uh, ampumilum can ameliorate inflammation in the bones. So inflammation, uh, oxidative stress is uh, also involved in causing degeneration of the trabecular network of the bones leading to osteoporosis in the absence of estrogen. So look at the we look at the markers of protein like NF kappa beta, IKK beta, which is the inflammatory markers, like and also interleukin six and interleukin one beta, uh, which shows there's high levels of inflammation in untreated uh, bones, uh, rats bones, and then following treatment there is reduced inflammation uh, in the uh, one treated with herbs and also the estrogen treated animals. Uh, and then we assess the levels of oxidative stress. The, all the antioxidants except KIP, uh, which is the uh, product of the, uh, the during oxidation, oxidative uh, stress. So the KIP1 levels increase when there is a high oxidative stress, but the, the rest of it will, uh, will try to prevent oxidative stress by increasing its amount like NRF2, HQ01, HO1 and all the uh, conventional uh, antioxidative enzymes like SOD and catalase. So they are all uh, reduced in the untreated group, but increase following treatment with the extract and is estradiol. This is we give glabenclamide as a control group to see whether that uh, effects can be also be uh, relieved by giving the, anti the conventional anti-diabetics. Uh, then, okay, uh, and then we evaluate the beta catenin, W anti beta catenin pathway in the bone, and we found that the levels of W anti uh, and the beta catenin is reduced in the diabetic, untreated diabetic rats, while treatment increases both of their levels. And these are the proteins, the receptors that are just now I explained. Uh, like Frizzel, DVL, LRP, which is reduced in the non-treated group, while in the treated group, it is increased significantly. And this is one of the complex that is responsible for the uh, destruction of the beta-catenin in the cytoplasm, GSK3-beta, increase in the diabetic group, while treatment reduces its level. That means ha you have more beta-catenin available in the cytoplasm, that can be translocated into the nucleus for gene transcription. And then this is the immunofluorescence, which we did uh, to show that the increase in beta catenin, which is the red uh, markers. This is the WNT3A, and the green one shows beta catenin, which is reduced in the non treated. Uh, there's stronger red and green signals in the treated and the estradiol treated group. This is the protein like the frizzle and DVL, which is also reduced in non-treated, once uh, treated with herbal uh, extract and also estradiol, in particular at 100 mg per kg per day and pumilum. Uh, the, le the levels of both uh, uh, receptors on osteoblast increase, which in indicates that uh, there is activation of, sorry, this is osteo osteoblast, yeah, or activation of osteoblast. Uh, activity. So once osteoblasts get activated, 
So you have more OPG produced and that inhibits the osteoclast. And this is the GSK 3 beta, which is high in the, uh, the untreated and low in the treat treated groups. GSK 3 beta is the one that uh, de uh, deplete the beta catenin, which is a good guy in the cells that helps in the uh, transcription of gene in the osteoblast. So once it's depleted, uh, once it, uh, the GSK beta is high, so beta catenin will be depleted and that will inhibit osteo osteoblasts in the uh, what they call that untreated groups. And we also look at the proliferation, bone proliferation, uh, PCNA and CNYC uh, are the markers of bone proliferation, uh, which is reduced in the uh, non-treated rats while uh, treatment increased, which is indicated by the brown uh, staining, which which are the proteins that appears to be the proteins related to proliferation like PCNA and CMYC. Okay, and finally, we did the LCMS to identify what are the compounds that is present in Marantodus pumilum. So there are a lot of compounds, some of them like gallic acid, uh, protocatenic acid, and vanillic acid, myrisatin, camphirol, and epigenin. Okay, so some of these compounds are known to be a potent phytoestrogens. So most likely that the phytoestrogenic activities of the extract are responsible for the bone protective effects. At the same time, uh, some of these compounds could have uh, antihyperglycemic activities. So these are the, sorry, these are the uh, summary of what happens is that treatment with ampumilum increase uh, this is the increase the rank and opg but reduce the rankle okay it also increased the bone formation markers and especially the collagen it reduces bone inflammation it increased the antioxidants enzyme uh, for the wmt catenin pathway it increased the wmt 3a frizzle and it reduces bone apoptosis and also increased bone proliferation so Collectively, these effects will result in decreased bone loss while increase the bone formation by increasing the function of the osteoblast and decreasing the function of the osteoclast. So this is the overall pathways, which are just now I explained. This is the proposed pathways uh, in osteoblast. Yeah? And then once you don't have the rankle, so you you and also you increase your antioxidant enzymes that will increase the osteoblast function yeah so the wnt this is the osteoblast wnt activation binding to the receptors of the uh, lrp are linked to these proteins okay so this will result in more beta catenin being uh the, the, what they call that degradation uh inhibit this complex being formed and then the beta catenin will translocate into the nucleus and leading to the synthesis of this uh uh proteins and so these are the summaries which what i have explained this now so these results uh, we have published uh, six papers in mostly in the ethnopharmacology journals related journals and uh, on the effects of marantodes pumilum on the uh, female reproductive organs and also some anti-hyperglycemic effects as well as its beneficial effects uh, in protecting the bones uh, in postmenopausal women with and without diabetes. So with that, I would like to thank uh, Associate Prof. Dr. Eswar Kumar for inviting me and the organizing committee of the International Webinar of Herbal, uh, Herbal Remedies today. And not to forget Dr. Nelly Giribabu, who uh, worked with me for many years and he's the one who introduced me to Andhra University. So thank you so much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nazib, your uh, excellent uh, presentation, a complete presentation on uh, Manitors. Unmute, unmute. Yeah, yeah, on uh, Manitors, Kamilam. Yeah, it's a complete presentation. I think uh, you have explored all possible mechanisms of its uh, uh, anti hyperglycemic activity as well as uh, uh, its. Uh, uh, 
uh, bone protect uh, bone protective activity particularly in uh, women yeah it's an excellent uh, presentation sir thank you very much and now with this okay. uh, uh, topic is open for uh, discussion if there are any questions uh, i request uh, the participants to ask the question any questions dr uh, boyni krishna kumar yeah yes okay in the absence of uh, questions i extend my uh, heartfelt uh, thanks to all the uh, speakers and all the participants now i request our uh, uh, colleague dr krishna manjari power uh, who is a uh, Uh, executive committee member of uh, andhra university and uh, uh, i i request her to uh, present a formal vote of thanks hey ask a question is sir kumar yeah madam madam is, please please madam uh, is there any uh, what is the uh, is that herb available in india what is the name is it oh, not so is it available I only in malaysia i think it's not uh, is i'm not sure whether they export it but it, it is only grows in the tropical uh rainforest means I, uh, i don't know whether india has the area with the tropical rainforest but i i don't think it's suitable for other climates so okay. it's not widely available there but still need to get it from this equatorial region okay is that available as a marketed product is the marketed, herb available as a i'm not sure maybe some companies uh, do export to india so i i i'm, I, I'm not sure whether Hey, thank you so much very so useful you, lecture so use the chemical powder sir it's a powder is it is it a powder form yeah you a, it is a, they they have made it a powder form some of them they they extract the active compounds and already uh, form the uh, like a medicine it's very interesting you have a lot of effects on that yeah <laughs> so you applied for the patent on it yeah yeah we patent uh, this already uh, this uh, findings here that's good yeah okay sir yeah now i request uh, dr krishnamanjari power to propose formal vote of thanks thank you so much sir a very good afternoon to all the dignitaries i deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on the occasion of international webinar on herbal remedies for chronic disorders which was commenced on the eve of super innovation of professor a annapurna madam au college of pharmaceutical sciences andhra university first and foremost i thank our president of webinar professor y rajendra prasad sir principal au college of pharmaceutical sciences for his unstinted support in organizing the webinar we are honored by the presence of our chief guest professor pvjd prasad reddy sir honorable vice chancellor of andhra university and it's my special pride to owe my gratitude to the visionary leader of his quality augmentation in making our institute a happening university in the country sir your presence had added an unreflected importance of such of in informative sessions in the upgradation of the knowledge i feel privileged to convey my heartfelt thanks to sir for his endeavors in inculcating the zeal of knowledge through his unstinted encouragement and guidance i would convey my sincere thanks to professor k samata madam rector andhra university for extending support to us in all the academic achievements through providing a various platforms and development programs and inspiring us to participate i truly express my gratitude to professor v krishna mohan sir officer on special duty andhra university for his dynamic administration and providing the facilities i thank the in charge registrar of the university professor g v ravindranath babu sir for his kind cooperation and motivation given to us i must mention my deep sense of gratitude to the eminent speakers of the webinar dr nagul bin sala 
MBBS, DFM, PGCAP, PhD, Associate Professor of University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I thank Dr. Kameshwara Badri, PhD, MB, Assistant Professor, Cardiovascular Research Institute, Morehouse School of Medicine, Atlanta, USA. I thank Dr. Krishna Kumar Viravalli, PhD, Associate Professor, University of Illinois, College of Medicine, Peoria, USA. I thank Krishna Boini, PhD, Assistant Professor, University of Houston, College of Pharmacy, USA, for their informative sessions, which have been feast for information through all their expertise and rendering their precious time in delivering the talks. It's my special thanks from my side and on behalf of my AU College of Pharmaceutical Sirs to all the speakers, sir. Thank you so much. I would like to convey my regards to the organizing secretary and treasurer, Dr. K. Ishwar Kumar Garu, Associate Professor, AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, for his organization and efforts to make this webinar a successful one. I owe my special gratitude to all the inspiring faculty members, retired faculty members, and all the private college faculty members and AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences for their valuable contribution in the organization of the webinar. I am also grateful to the distinguished invitees and all the registered participants for accepting our invitation and being a patient listener for all the sessions and wish you all uh, the success in their future prospects. I express my thanks to Director AU Computer Center and especially I thank the team members Chaitanya, Ramakrishna, Vamshi and Surendra for their wonderful support in organizing the webinar and other virtual sessions conducted in the university throughout uh, the, since the COVID pandemic has started. And I thank the members of the print and electronic media for uh, even enhancing uh, the interest in covering the event and all good hearts who worked behind the screen. Once again, on behalf of AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University, we are so thankful for your attention and cooperation in making this occasion a resourcing success and resounding success. Wishing you all a safe and healthy year ahead. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ishwar Kumar, sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. I want to mention a uh, uh, few more uh, uh, scholars of our uh, pharmacology and pharmacy practice department who are uh, the instrumental in organizing this uh, entire event so successfully. I thank uh, all my uh, scholars of uh, pharmacology as well as pharmacy, pharmacy practice department. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nazib. So I'll uh, call you again. And Dr. Uh, Krishna Kumar. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Thank you, thank you. I'll, uh, wonderful. I hope to see you in the evening. I, I think uh, you will join in the evening for uh, Madam uh, Felicitation function. Sure. Yeah. We'll try, sir. Yeah. It's yeah, 2 p.m. Thank, it's two, thank 2 in you. the morning, actually. But it, yeah, see, yeah. Maybe uh, for you, I think, uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think it's 4.30, uh, sir. 1 o'clock one, one o'clock in the night? 2, 2. 2 p.m. 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. No problem, sir. Right, right. So, right, when is right. the function, sir, at two th at four thirty? Actually, it is at five o'clock. I don't know how much it will be for you. I think it will be in the morning. Four, I think. Yeah. See, five thirty for us. Five thirty. Five thirty in the morning. I think. Yeah. 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 yeah three hours. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you once again. No, thank you. Welcome, sir. Welcome, right, sir. sir. Thank you. Thank you right. for your organizing this webinar. Okay, right. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good job. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye. 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 Yeah.